The following is a conversation with Ben Burgess, who, among many other things, has written a book about a man who holds a very outsized influence on my life. This man is, of course, Christopher Hitchens. And the book Ben wrote is called Christopher Hitchens, What He Got Wrong and What He Got Right. And the absolute last thing that I wanted to do was get into an argument with Ben about the merits of Hitchens' particular politics as they changed throughout his life, largely just because I don't know enough, but secondly, because Ben is a professional debater and I want to do my best to avoid uh, embarrassment. But the truth is, in response to this question, I don't have any sophistication or opinion when arguing why Hitchens was wrong on X or why he was right on Y. Because if you know Ben Burgess, then you would expect that a more argumentative style of conversation would be natural here, especially since that's how the rest of his interviews about this book have gone. But instead, this chat is simply a celebration of the life of Christopher Hitchens, because at the end of the day, both Burgess and I are just big Hitchens fanboys. Even though Ben might have some chasm deep differences on some of his politics, in this podcast instead, we just speak about who Christopher Hitchens was, what he did, and then hopefully as well, a little bit about what informed his changing political views one way or another throughout his life. And if you are a Hitch fanboy like me, then I'm sure, and I really, really do hope, that you will like this chat. I remember when um, Alexander O'Connor, the cosmic skeptic, saying in a video criticizing Hitchens of sophistry that he has surely watched every minute of Hitch on YouTube. And I remember saying to myself at that time, wow, there's another one out there who loves Hitchens just as much as me because I thought I had watched every single recorded minute that Hitchens had ever been had participated in. And to even top that off for some more flavor, uh, many of my favorite clips, debates, speeches, and interviews of Hitchens I've consumed multiple times. I'm such a degenerate of Hitchens content that I've even watched his C-SPAN appearances multiple times because some of them are just so good at expressing what is the absolute best about Hitch. So... Ever since I started this podcast, I've been on the keen lookout uh, for someone to speak with about Hitch. I, in fact, initially tried to reach out to Alexander O'Connor because I thought he might be someone very interesting to speak directly about Hitchens with. But I'm very happy uh, that I found Ben in this case. And even though Hitchens' politics was enormously divisive and his position as one of the most prominent new atheists biz was so controversial... My interest in this great man actually lies elsewhere. Because what makes Hitchens someone who is so fascinating to me, and someone who has had such an outsized impact on my life, truly he's impacted the way I think, the way that I talk, and even I think to a degree, my values. It's Hitchens' attitude, his enormously eclectic range of curiosities, his friendships, his writing, his erudition, his anecdotes and his delivery. Hitchens was the greatest speaker I've ever seen anywhere. And granted, that's not saying much since I don't necessarily have a, a recall of great speakers that I have seen or anything. But the voice, the language, the emotion, the irony. Hitchens had the sort of timing that comedians are envious of. I'm sure that I am not wrong in asserting that he really must be one of the most charismatic and forceful speakers who ever lived. So in this conversation... Uh, about the life of Christopher Hitchens, we cover burning the candle at both ends, Hitchens being much more than just Iraq and religion, Hitchens' family, his brother, the famous Peter Hitchens, his mother and his father, and also finally what Hitchens would make of some of the political issues of our day. And apparently there are a few Hitchens biographies cooking around there at the moment, so hopefully I'll be able to get those authors on the podcast and in due time get to celebrate Hitch again. Now, uh, please hang around to the end because I'm actually going to read out my favorite Hitchens quotes and also directly put in from his self-narrated autobiography uh, um, an amazing um, part of it just for your, for your own consumption. So also as well, hang around to the end to hear me explain my ambition for this podcast. And now with absolutely no further ado, here is the shaggy and wonderful Ben Burgess. Mr. Burgess, thank you so much for joining me, mate. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to borrow some of your time and to speak about Christopher Hitchens. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So 
The first question comes at the end of the book. Um, in the acknowledgement yeah. section, you inter- you speak about the people that you interviewed, you know, friends of Hitchens, contemporaries of Hitchens, um, people that critiqued him, but then also people that, you know, just sympathized with him and liked him. What did you learn about him hmm. through these conversations with people that knew him directly that mm-hmm. maybe surprised you or at least reaffirmed things you thought before? Yeah, I mean, I I think that out of conversations that I've had with people who actually knew the man, I think the uh, the most striking thing that I heard, which was, uh, you know, I guess it's not new information because it's consistent with what he said, but it's it's just kind of funny, was his brother Peter, uh, who was describing uh, his uh, militant atheism and saying that. Uh, he thought that that was actually Christopher's most consistent position over the course of his life. He estimated for about the age of eleven. So that was that was from the mouth of Peter. Yeah, that was from the mouth of Peter. Yeah. Okay. That they. Would, what, what do you make of Peter Hitchens? I mean, he's clearly uh, like <laughs> the antithesis to your politics, but I don't know. Well, yeah, I, I, he's he's an interesting person. Uh, I I think. Uh, so I read his book, uh, The Rage Against God, which is sort of, in a weird way, sort of his anti, like, new atheism book. You know, it, it's in, in a in a sense, it's kind of his response to God is not great, but it's really more of a you know personal memoir than it is anything else uh, about his own relationship to religion, and and his you know his view of the world is like extraordinarily alien to me. Like he he sort of. Um, like he comes very close to just saying like, well, who knows really, you know, like, like we can't know for sure, but you should, you should believe because it's like good for social order or something. That's, that's <laughs> might be a little bit of a caricature, but I don't think very much. Uh, so his view of the world is extraordinarily alien to me, but I will say that uh, I, I do, you know, try to make myself sit down and read the occasional conservative book just to, just to kind of keep myself honest and, and get a sense of, you know, what the, uh, opposition, you know, saying and thinking, and uh, and and he he is a much better writer than most of these people are, and uh, and it was it was just more fun to read on that level than uh, than they are. But there's also something very funny about the fact that he's Christopher Hitchens' brother, mm. because um, you know you said he was the um, opposite of what I think, and I think you know of course there are incredibly deep uh, differences between what I think and what he thinks, certainly, but like. I think he's like really the the exact opposite of what Christopher Hitchens thought. Like exactly, like because uh, um, you know Christopher was of course a you know atheist, which which has took up increasingly more of his time and energy in the last several years of his life. Uh, and he's somebody who came out of the far left and did an ambiguous way. You know, at the end of his life, still stayed true to some of those commitments uh, while having you know very pro interventionist foreign policy views. Peter is devoutly religious and uh and is a uh like right wing like paleocon isolationist uh so uh who yeah. opposed the Iraq Has war wet so, dreams I mean, like, about the old British Empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean like he, he could not he, he could not possibly be more different than what Christopher thought. I don't know um really anything about Peter Hitchens apart from what is anecdotally mentioned through Christopher Hitchens mm-hmm. appearances and work and obviously the debate they did together which you covered both of them in the book um mm-hmm. but I do remember Peter saying that he was a, a Trotskyite so I think and then he was also the Mos- he, he was a foreign correspondent in Moscow for the longest yep. time yep. um so I mean maybe he revealed it in his in his book that was kind of more Irish mm-hmm. but I mean he wasn't all, it's not like from in the yeah, household, yeah. you know, Peter yeah, Hitchens yeah, it's, it's, was <laughs> the commander, the the just pure Tory, and then Christopher Hitchens was Yvonne, yeah, yeah. the pure libertarian. Um, it was maybe No, their views were their views were I I guess pretty much the same uh at you know, in like the early seventies. Uh and, and then they just dramatically diverged. So uh <laughs> it, it's funny, yeah. I mean, Christopher uh denied what's the word? He denied being called a contrarian. He he said that mm-hmm. he's not a contrarian and he hates the word, which is yeah, in yeah. itself. There's something contrarian to that as well, like yeah, ref- yeah. a refusal to be labeled at all costs. But Peter Hitchens is that as well, but just on steroids. If you've been watching him <laughs> recently, he's been deferred to quite a lot, given his, his experience in Moscow, um, to comment on the Ukraine war. And right. I... Um, 
you know, I do like tuning into him uh, because he sort of reminds me of Christopher a little bit. And I do really appreciate someone that's trying to speak with in prose almost. I I really, (laughs) even if it's, and this is probably the largest reason I like Christopher Hitchens. It wasn't necessarily what he was saying. It was just how he was saying it. Um, Sure. But Peter Hitchens has a little bit of that as well. Unfortunately, he cannot live up to the standards of Christopher uh, set, but there's just something where they have to be contrarian. Yeah, yeah, you do get that sense that both cases that uh, they they speak in fully formed paragraphs and um, uh, and there is this you know I mean there is this like kind of wealth of historical and literary references which is actually pretty funny if if you watch the uh, Iraq debate that they did that uh, that there's like literally a moment in there where uh, Peter's like quoted some poetry that I'm I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm like too much of a philistine to like be familiar with and uh and then uh and then christopher like when he starts his, his statement he corrects him about the, you know what the exact <laughs> quote is <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean i i think he's certainly i think as a rhetorician christopher you know was in a class by himself uh you know and, and, and peter's certainly not there but i mean like there are there are some of the features that made it that made it fun to listen to to uh christopher that are uh, that are present in um in peter and i and i do think that they i do think that it's probably true um like even though i do think uh in both cases actually that the that like the positions are like you know deeply felt ones that like that this is that they are very sincere but um but I also do think that like both of them do just kind of enjoy pissing people off also. Right. You know, <laughs> like that there is a, you know, like, like I've always wondered if part of the explanation for why, even if Peter's correct, which again, is consistent with what Christopher wrote that, uh, that, you know, Christopher's, you know, position on religion was pretty much the same from the age of 11 onward. Uh, it is really striking that if you, if you listen to, uh, him talk and read his writing over the decades it's like that position is always there but it's 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 relatively muted for like the vast majority of his career right it's it's he his his actual views on religion don't change you know you can find things in like 1982 where he substantially says what he says and uh, god is not great but uh it's a very very small part of his output until very late right the last few years and i think there are probably a few reasons for that but i cannot help but wonder if part of the reason is that like at some level it just made him uncomfortable to be uh constantly agreed with conservatives in the uh the war on terror era and uh he enjoyed emphasizing the thing that he thought that was yeah. going to make them the most angry <laughs> i mean that's that's perhaps a bit of psychology from afar sure, maybe sure, not sure. maybe sure, not course, fair if know, it was yeah. something he held since he was a, an 11 year old yeah, boy yeah. And, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't. I don't think he was making up his views. Certainly, no, no. like you know, and, like and, like I, I do. I do wonder why he. It suddenly became something he emphasized much more, and I think there's probably a much more charitable explanation of that in terms of some of what was going on culturally at the time. But, mm. uh, but like again, I do wonder again from very distant time and place. You know that the so of course there's no way to know, right? I, I do wonder <laughs> if he enjoyed that aspect of it. I I do like that take though that you know, he had spent too much time with people siding with him and he needed to be in his own group. And therefore, Uh, well, all these new friends, watch this. Your entire belief structure is absolute BS. It's man-made. But I I think actually it's, there's probably an easier explanation, which is this. I think God is not great came after Dawkins, after Harris, after Bennett. And he really, really admired particularly Harris and Dawkins for being like hard scientists um, Hitchens says in several interviews, but uh, most um, directly in the uh, interview that his publisher put on for the audiobook of his autobiography, Hitch 22. And he just, just says directly, you know, I wish I had uh, a capacity for some technician and I had a hard mm-hmm. science and I could make a, a, a difference there rather than just be this scribbler, you know, who's not necessarily yeah, right. making a difference. Um, so, but is yeah, this and, a buy- and I think it- Oh, sorry. Oh, I, I think that does help to explain his his affinity with those people, given that, um, you know, given that in a lot of ways, um, you know, even though they sort of converged on the view about about religion, you know, like I think a lot of 
you know, I think there are a lot of things about the ways that, you know, they saw the world and politics and all of that, 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 that are, are substantially different. Right. And, and I think that there, there are, um, you know, there are things about like what someone like Sam Harris thought even back then, right. You know, that the, that like when, when Hitchens was still alive, uh, that, you know, that I think are just, are just very different, especially in terms of how he thought about morality, you know, that, uh, that, that how, that how Hitchens did. Um, but I think that like both the fact that they were all spending their time on this target that he, you know, agreed was a good target. Mm. And also some of what you're, some of what you're talking about, about the, the kind of, um, admiration for, you know, for hard science, you know, Harris's mm. background mm. in neuroscience, you know, Dawkins and biology, you know, that's interesting. I think that, I think that probably does do a lot of explanatory work there and saying, you know, how, you know, he ended up thinking as highly as those guys as he did. Mm-hmm. And any, he very much, you know, wanted to be sort of in their company. And because he was just from all reports, such a terrifically charismatic and fun person to be around, they very much oh, yeah. wanted to be in his company as well. Um, yeah. Because I guess, no, absolutely. yeah. Yeah, yeah um, for sure. To return to the the, the dialectic, uh, yeah, we yeah. commented earlier that Peter Hitchens speaks very well. Um, Christopher Hitchens spoke very well. Is this just a bias of mine? Or do just people speak less good these days? And look at that <laughs> that sentence there is in itself an example. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, Gore Vidal, uh, yeah. you know, William Buckley. Maybe I'm just cherry picking, but has there been a decline in the way pr- people present themselves? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because I think if at the very least, I think what is true is that Buckley, Vidal, Hitchens... Uh, that these are these are people who, you know, who did both, you know, write and speak um, in this really impressive way, uh, and had this like kind of cultural prominence while they did it, right? I mean, I think that's the I think that's in some ways the key point. What, what and, do you mean by cultural providence? Oh yeah, sure. So like, these are people who like, you know. I mean, they were on TV all the time, right? I mean, just just to be that crude about it, right? You know that mm. the and and so I do think what is true at the very least is that it's hard to think of the equivalent right now. That in other words, um, you know, whatever you think about where the sort of average was, you know, in you know whatever 1990, you know, versus now, uh, it's it's certainly the case that. I can't think off the top of my head, at least, of the the person who is on the level of those three that you just mentioned, uh, who is is quite as much. I mean, you know, I guess you know, Peter Hitchens is uh, is is gets the uh, is is one, you know, very old. Right? But he's also he's, he's, he's also a of, bit he's a bit weird, so it kind of cancels <laughs> out the, the 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 terrific delivery. Can, can you think yeah. of anyone like? Yeah, no, I can't think of anybody who's uh, who's who's in the, of that caliber who is like who's doing like okay, so think about like Hitchens in the last few years of his life that he was uh, he was regularly besides Vanity Fair like he was also like he he wrote for Slate regularly right you know he had a, he had a column at Slate uh, he was on he would go on um, you know on Fox News to uh, to have. Uh, uh, in, in this sort of weird dual double role, right? Because they liked his uh, they liked his foreign policy views, but you know he would also <laughs> kind of be the, the atheist whipping boy, you know, for mm-hmm. uh, you know for Sean Hannity or Greg Gutfeld to uh, you know to um, uh, to argue with uh, mm-hmm. in that capacity, and and I can't think of anybody who is that sort of uh, of writer and, and and speaker who is. Uh, you know, who, who is doing the equivalent things now, right? You know, who's, who's, who's like regularly at Slate and, uh, you know, or like whatever. I mean, you know, pick your, you know, pick a roughly equivalent example and is, is regularly on, on cable news. So I, I think there might be less of an appetite for it. I think it also might be the case that, uh, that social media, you know, I mean, I, I just, said that Peter Hitchens is very old. This is going to make me sound a little bit old, but like, I think that social media is like terrible for people's attention spans. So the um, science is in that's uh, that's, that's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I think that like, 
you know, I think you have fewer people who have the patience to to read the sort of thing that all of those guys were writing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I I think like to a very great extent, people just react to headlines, uh, which. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, which I think about all the time as a writer, because like you know, you've, you put so much effort into what goes ins- uh, goes on in the piece, and then the headline, which is the part that you typically don't write, right, is uh, <laughs> is what people uh, is what people oh, get mad about. That must be so disheartening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but I think that's part of it. I also think that the uh, I also think the economics of media have changed in ways that probably aren't good for uh for producing the kind of output that those guys produced where they they'd like you know write some interesting essay and then like go on you know video media to uh, to talk true, about it true um that i mean if if nothing else like just this idea that you know you could have this sort of job where you like what are um you know christopher hitchens in like in say you know, 1998, right? I mean, like, what are, like, what are his weekly commitments, right? Like, he has to, you know, he, you know, he owes something to Vanity Fair, he owes something to the nation, and... But he know. supposedly was extremely prol- prolific and would write oh, he, book reviews routinely and, um, you know, more than just his committed columns. No, that's that's true, that's true. He did put out a tremendous amount of literary criticism also, but the, the, point, the point just being that, like... I mean, I actually think um, I actually think Hitchens, in particular, if he had beaten cancer in 2011, uh, probably actually could have adapted okay, right? Like, 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 because because he was just that prolific that, mm-hmm. like, even as the actual and like whatever else was Christopher Hitchens, people would have paid him more. But you know, they have a but like he would have, uh, he would have done more than fine, Ben. He would have one of the most subscribed podcasts out there, I would imagine. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Even if, even in the worst case scenario where he, like none of the places that used to publish him would, would touch him, which, you know, you could contrive a scenario where you could see how that could happen. Uh, the, uh, like, I'm not sure that it would have, you know, uh, in his case, but, but I think, you know, even if you think it would have been gotten to the point where for various reasons, you know, he would have said things that were just so radioactive that, you know, that, that he, he didn't have his, uh, his normal media outlets. Mm. And so he just had like a sub stack. Well, whatever. I mean, it would be, you know, <laughs> it, it would, it would be updated five times a week. Uh, yeah, it would yeah, be beautifully yeah. written because by all accounts, he didn't require much editing and, uh, and, and it would have a zillion, you know, it would have a zillion subscribers and he'd still be just fine, you know, but like yeah. in, but I, I think that, so I think if we're talking about hitches as an individual, Right. Then I think that um, that I think these are, these changes might not have affected him adversely. But I think if we're talking about like why there aren't more people like that, then I think that these facts become relevant. Right. That you could have. I mean, even though, yes, Hitchens is like put it out an insane amount of work all the time because, you know, because he likes it, you know, uh, and he can and, you know, and all of that. Right. You. Uh, I think there were people who, you know, I think a lot of people given the jobs at like Vanity Fair and the nation would have just done that. And, you know, they would have been okay just mm. doing that. Right. Mm. And, uh, and I think that that's really good for, you know, having, you know, for being able to like really take your time with things and think about them. And, uh, um, and, and I think, uh, and I think that that has, I think that that's, um, you know, I think that that's moved in a really bad direction because if nothing else, most media outlets, you know, just pay most people very little. Uh, and uh, and so I think that disincentivizes that. I think that uh, it's also, um, I think also just the way that media has become so fragmented, which is certainly a process that was like, you know, well underway, you know, by the time Hitchens died. But, um, but I, I think that there's a lot more of an incentive to just sort of pander to like your particular audience, uh, in, in just a different way. Than oh, well, their, without a doubt you get yeah. economically more economically rewarded to do that now than probably ever. Right. Exactly. So there's I think so that many that, great examples of that just in the last year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not, not, yeah. not to mention any, any names. <laughs> no, but I. I'm with you, right? So I think yeah. that, like, uh, 
all of which I think might just be like structural changes in media that make it less likely to be the case that you're going to get a lot of, you know, Gorfinals and, you know, um, like, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking like the, I'm thinking like all of these people that you mentioned would like argue with like Norman Baylor on like TV and like, you know, like back when I'm just, I'm just thinking about how unlikely it is that like somebody who was like a, you know, popular novelist with like, you know, intellectual heirs, you know, that like, I don't know, like Jonathan Franzen is not going to, you know, is not going to have quite that level of cultural prominence that they're going to like, you know, bring him on whatever the 2022 equivalent is of the Dick Cavett show to like argue with political commentators. That's just not going to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, what do you make of this? I mean, um, you know, you, uh, you have your own podcast, you've appeared on the largest podcast in the world. Um, you know, do you think that podcasting generally is a medium and forgive me, I know this is actually not about Hitchens, so maybe it's the wrong question, but do you think it, it does give you that opportunity though? Um, say for example, if you appear on the equivalent of the, you know, Dick Cavett, Johnny Carson show now, you can't, or the, the Bill Buckley show, what was it called? Uh, Fireline or something. Fire and Light, yeah. Yeah. You can have that level on a podcast these days and it could be a, you know, histories and cycles and we're coming back to this great, you know, mm. audio medium where you have the longer form. Do, do, like, I don't know, do, that maybe runs a bit contrary to what you just said, but do you think that that's possible or you're seeing that? Yeah, I think, I, I think there might be something to that. I think that it's, yeah, I think how podcasts fit into the, the sort of pessimistic picture I was just painting is a little bit complicated because I think some of those trends, you know, affect podcasts, right? I mean, that the, uh, uh, I mean, you, you kind of obliquely mentioned, uh, Joe Rogan, who I, who I actually think is an interesting example there because, uh, he's, uh, he's somebody who, um, you know, cause whatever his like flaws and virtues, right. Uh, and, and I so you know, not want to be sidetracked onto that, but like whatever those are, <laughs> right? Like I think that it's certainly the case that um, that he's actually not doing that, right? That he's that he's that he's not just like you know pandering to like the the biases of a particular audience, right? I mean, like whatever objections you might have to him, that's not going to be one of them. I, I don't mm. think it can be, you know that. Um, uh, you know, I I think if there's anybody who is who is genuinely trying to to uh, to call balls and strikes by his own sensibilities, you know that that would be you know that would be it. Uh, and and he will have like three hour in depth conversations with like both you know Ben Shapiro and me, right? So sure, yeah, no, he uh, he gets he gets a tremendously hard time, but I guess that's what happens when you're at the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard uh, not to feel like a sincerity and genuineness from him. I mean, you met the man. Is yeah, he the same? I mean, yeah, no. I, I, the, the impression I got from him from my limited interactions with him before and after the, the interview itself was very consistent with that. You know, mm. so, uh, so yeah. And I, I, I think, um, yeah, I think all of that stuff is true. And that is, as you said, the most popular podcast in the world. So maybe that is, a, you know, maybe that is a sign that I'm being too grim. Decent aware, signal. Right? You know, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I, I think so, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think that uh, now if you had, um, you know, you know, if you had that sort of um, willingness to talk to a broad range of people with, with an open mind, which I think is like the great virtue of, of, of Rogan. And like, um, you were also like, you know, and you also, and you were also reading a lot of 3000 word essays and like, you know, talking to, you know, and like sort of rewarded your, you know, uh, your Vidal Hitchens, you know, Mailer, you know, Buckley kinds of people then, um, you know, like that, I think would be in really good shape. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that there, I think there are a lot of ways in which, in which certain kinds of media have gotten really bad. I think podcasting is a mixed bag, but I think that there are, yeah, I think there's some signs of hope and, and I, I would love to, uh, I guess it could have, it could theoretically have happened, you know, since, since they did overlap by, uh, uh, you know, I don't remember what year the show started, but it was the 2000 sometime, but that would have been really interesting if we got in the, uh, Oh, you the, mean Rogan Hitchens? 
the Rogan Hitchens uh, oh, it conversation. Been amazing, mate. It would have been amazing. If you look at the popularity of Sam Harris's podcast, um, yeah. I think Hitchens would have done one very similar, you know, touches on cultural mm-hmm. issues, um, you know, heavy slice of um, the left, but also heavy slice of uh, atheism. And you just look at the popularity of Harris, you know, and, you know, Hitchens is 10 Harris's. No disrespect to Sam Harris. He'd probably admit the same. No, but I, um, I do. But yeah, be, no, I think, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, I, I think so, and I think you would have been interested in doing so. I think, like, given the sort of range of things, mm. that the sort of range of media things that he did over the course of his life, I see no reason to think that, like, if that was like presented to him and he had some sense of what the possibilities were, I see no reason mm. to think he wouldn't have gone for it. For sure, for sure. I mean, Amos, his best friend Martin Amos, um, echoes the same sentiments that many people gave Hitchens and himself self-describe it. You know, he sort of burnt the candle at both ends. You know, he never yeah. turned down a job. He took every job <laughs> he possibly could. And so, of course, the today on the, the podcast circuit that any new author gets to do, you know, Douglas Meyer released a book a week or two ago. I think I've seen him, uh, the thumbnail comes up on YouTube, you know, like 15, 20 different shows. And that's just the ones that I'm seeing in my own echo chamber. It's like, what the, you know, how many, how many shows is a guy like this doing? It's, it's uh, <laughs> you can imagine that for the book promotion would have been, you know, doubly so. Um, yeah. And on that point as well of his sort of would never turn, burning the candle at both ends would, would, uh, would yeah. never turn so down what's, a job. What's the, I think in, in uh, Hitch 22, he quotes Gore Fidel telling, uh, giving him a crucial piece of early advice, which has never turned down the opportunity to have sex on grown television. Yes. <laughs> and I think Gore Vidal also gave him the advice that um, uh, it's rude to only have sex with a person once or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Nice guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, to finish off that point, you know, like of his burning the candle at both ends, which, you know, obviously um, for those who don't know, I guess we've done a terrible job of introducing Hitch, but if you don't know, you've probably dropped off by now, but you know, he, yeah. um, he died at 61, 62 years old of cancer in 2011, esophageal cancer. He smoked most of his life. He, you know, from all reports mm-hmm. was a very famous boozer. So, um, you know, really burnt the candle at both ends, that great Blade Runner, uh, mm-hmm. quote. I don't know if that's actually originally from Blade Runner, if he took that from someone, but yeah, the, the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. So, yeah. yeah, at the end of a long night of drinking and eating, uh, you know, Rushdie would be snoring in the corner. Martin Amos would be like struggling <laughs> off to bed, and Hitchens would just sit down at the typewriter and you know, supposedly <laughs> turn in unedited copy. Like uh, that, it's you know, those sort of anecdotes really create this amazing character of a person that you just can't help but admire, and also you know, like uh, uh, yeah, no, trying to sure. emulate, yeah. Yeah, no, as as somebody who I think um, is able to to write more and more quickly than most people, uh, you you, I, I I hear stories like that, and I, and I cannot wrap my mind around it if it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, for sure. Um, I and I think that that's like a lot of um, you know, and I I think that certainly for me. You know, I mean, that's definitely some of the appeal, just just kind of like, uh, you know, Christopher Hitchens as, uh, you know, as like, yeah, as like a literary character, you know, as uh, like, yeah, is, is just, exactly. it's just incredibly, it's just incredibly appealing, right? I mean, like I, I read, uh, I think I actually read this after I'd, I'd read the book, but it's just sort of like I saw it as like, after ah, the sake of completeness, right? You know, I'll pick this up because I haven't read it. There's this uh, collection of, of his interviews. It's like the last interview and other interviews. And in, uh, in one of them, there's something that's like a, a profile of him. Uh, I do not remember who wrote it or for where, but um, but it's you know it's in the you know chemo ball Hitchens era. You know at the at the you know at the very end, but you know he's he's not in the hospital. He's uh, still in his apartment, and it's a very like atmospherically written thing. Uh, you know, they talk about the two of the you know like watching the sunrise and stuff like that. And uh, but the there is this like very funny line in there about how. You figured, okay, well, you know, I mean, the man is has cancer. He's, you know, he's in very bad shape. So I mean, like, obviously, you know, obviously, I assume he's not drinking the Johnny Walker anymore. But maybe if I like bring over a bottle of wine, like maybe he could have some of that. <laughs> and he, and he, you know, and the uh, profile writer says, you know, when he saw it, you know, Hitchens like thanked him very kindly because he said he was out of wine, so he wouldn't have been able to offer him any other anywhere, <laughs> and then just like poured himself a slug of whiskey and claimed that like none of his doctors had specifically told him not to do that. <laughs> Which is probably well, literally true. Yeah, for sure. For sure. 
there, there's a, another anecdote like that. Um, early in the morning, the New Yorker is doing a profile of him. And I think this yeah. is Martin Amos again telling this anecdote. And um, yeah, very early in the morning, 9, 10 a.m. And Hitchens writes in Hitch 22, it's, it's, it's easy to get a, a reputation as a boozer in Washington. If you have two white glasses of white wine at lunch, you're an alcoholic. You know, obviously the standards are different in the United Kingdom. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he rocks up and he she knocks on the door. She's like some dainty little woman. <laughs> and he's got this you know, cigarette out of the mouth, whiskey in one hand. And he goes, I'm sorry. I started without you. <laughs> she comes up the door, you know? Um, but yeah. I, 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 this again, forgive me. It's not directly about Hitchens, but sure. I, I wrote it down as a question as you were speaking before. I heard yeah. an anecdote recently of how much um, Gore Vidal was paid to write books and the type of lifestyle he got to lead because of it. And then I'm listening now as well to Stephen King's autobiography on writing. And he says mm-hmm. that for Carrie, he actually got a $200,000, um, I don't know, it's not an advance because the book was already written, but he got paid that. His first book, fiction, you know, a nobody author. And I just know that today that's completely impossible this, this ties into the anecdote that i heard and it was actually doug smart yeah. who pointed out with Gore, Gore vidal you're someone who's firmly in the you know the knows about that world can you comment on that the the sort of the way that authors are compensated over time and maybe how that's going now yeah i mean for sure right i mean this is um i mean i think uh yeah i mean that two hundred thousand dollar uh advance for uh for carrie uh is is certainly uh unimaginable and 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 just kind of amazing to think about right because because this is like um yeah i mean you know i think i think king had like published a couple of novels under his pen name you know like that like weren't very successful but like as i think as far as publisher knew this Mm. is the first one right you know Mm. that uh (laughs) and uh um as this, yeah, as, as a like high school English teacher, and he'd uh, and, and he'd written that, and and yeah, I think that tells you something about uh, j- probably just how much bigger the the you know the market was uh, that they that they had that kind of money to. Uh, so it uh, is to, true that people buy less books. I I I I think so. I mean, I think it's certainly true that the uh, that. You know, I mean, I would I would claim to be an, an expert on the logistics of uh, of publishing on that end, right? I mean, like like I I you know not my department, but I think that the but I I'd certainly it's certainly my impression that it would make sense, right? I mean, because if you think about I don't know what year you know Carrie came out, but that was what sometime in the seventies, you know that's yeah, I don't uh, know. uh but you know you think about that time compared to to now, right? I mean, like. Okay, TV existed, movies existed, but you know, like this was, you know, like a kind of uh, Paul Poor novel like Carrie. I mean, that's that's like right at the top of like the sort of main forms of uh, of fictional entertainment, right? That are that are out there, and you know, you just contrast that to uh, you know to right now, and and I would be, I mean, just a priori, I would be shocked if it weren't true that, mm. you know, that, that, that like, at least outside of, you know, I mean like Stephen King now maybe, right. You know, sure. but like, you know, but like somebody who's, you know, but like even a, first like t- a Jordan yeah. Peterson, I could imagine maybe he'd get a $200,000 advance and then revenue cut even like yeah, yeah. someone who can guarantee a million books, for example. Yeah, I would think so. Right. So, uh, you know, I mean, I have, you know, I mean, I, I got, uh, I mean, actually my, you know, upcoming book which is from verso which is uh which is actually a place that hitchens published a lot of books uh bring it back there but like uh i i know that the advance they paid me and my co-authors for that is like really big by the standards of their recent history and it certainly is nearly two hundred thousand dollars <laughs> so uh, so so yeah i mean i think that like unless there are other points in the sort of economics of this that I'm, I'm i'm missing right i mean i think it i think it must be that like stuff that's not like crazy bestsellers you know that the that the actual numbers they're working with are much lower which would be consistent with uh i think a lot of other things that have happened and would at least mirror you know the reason why like 
you know, some of what we were talking about with the, the collapse of certain kinds of traditional media earlier that, mm. um, you know, like, I mean, I think particularly like the, the segmenting of it, right? I mean, there's, there's a really good book by, uh, about this by uh, Matt Taibbi called Hate Inc., where, um, you know, essentially the, the story tells it there is that, you know, the number of people watching like even like cable news, like the, the the most successful stuff on cable news, right? You know, your your Tucker Carlson's and Rachel Maddow's, whatever. You know, I mean, this is like a tiny fraction of the number of people who like tuned in to watch Walter Cronkite talk about the Vietnam War or whatever. You know, because if nothing else, there there's so many ways. Um, you know, it's so, you know, instead of being like having like just like watching TV is watching TV and you've got a few channels, right? You know, and uh, it's like, which of these five am I going to watch, right? You know, you have, uh, you know, I mean, you've you've got, um, you know, you have pay- cable packages that, you know, that have a zillion channels. Uh, you've, you've got YouTube, you've got, you know, podcasts, mm, mm, uh, mm. you know, you could be, you could very successfully like, just about anybody right like can if they want to they can just order this kind of media diet a la carte and they could just you know they can just like surround themselves in nothing but media that agrees with them sure all day every day uh and so you have all these bad incentives that are that are built into that you know that like um you know i mean certainly even in terms of like straight news media that uh you know there's there are a lot of incentives, you know, I mean, like, I think it's why you get a lot of inaccuracy now, because there are a lot of incentives to sort of, um, to jump the, you know, to like jump the gun when like, you know, in the sort of fog of war, something has just happened, you know, and, and you, and, you know, you and there's stuff that happened, there's stuff that's reported initially that matches your narrative. And so there's tremendous incentive to just run with it initially. And yeah. there are very few incentives to go back and correct the record later. Uh, and, um, and I think that with, um, and I think with, with opinion and commentary, you know, which is what's relevant if we're talking about the difference between like the eras in which Christopher Hitchens was working. And now uh, it's, you know, I think it's, it's bad in a different way. Right. I mean, I think even like slate uh, in 2000 and, 10 or whatever you know is probably a slightly different beast than, than than even like slate now because i would imagine you know that the uh as the sort of media ecosystem has exploded the way that it has right i mean like i i i would be surprised if it were not the case that it's it it's uh it's narrowed down to you know a particular slice of people by and large who are mm. reading it and the opinion and commentary there is probably going to pander to to those people because because i mean that's that's where that's where all the uh the incentives are i mean which is yeah. which is you know one of the reasons why you know i mean you know again this this gets into an area we could talk about with hitchens but i mean like it's it's one of the you know because one of the reasons that i'm um one of the reasons that i find hitchens interested is you know going back to what you said about him earlier as a speaker i think that he was um probably the best debater in the sort of era in which debates have been captured on youtube i mean mm. I, I don't know i'm actually not sure who the competition is there and so um you know but it's like what so that's definitely one of the reasons that i'm i'm interested in because i'm somebody who's interested in doing debates for many reasons but one of which is that in this media landscape this is like the only chance you ever get to talk to somebody else's audience uh, one more on that what's your take on this i've heard that audiobook consumption can be as much as 50-50 versus a physical book mm. sale. I think with the this is just a total speculation. I don't have any data to support it, but with a with the rise of podcasting as a yeah. very popular medium, I think audiobooks very neatly complements that because an audiobook is just a longer podcast much more refined yeah, yeah 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 this could maybe be uh, people are reading more now or at least ingesting more um you know yeah well-crafted I mean, I think, paragraphs now yeah i think they're almost certainly reading more uh than um than they would without that they right? might, i mean i don't yeah, yeah. I, I i don't i don't i don't certainly don't have those numbers you know handy you know for like what the kind of total of printed audiobooks is now versus you know printed you know well, I guess there were still audiobooks then because there were like books on CD and stuff, but, you know, printed audiobooks in like 1995. Mm. Uh, I'm sure audiobooks are much higher now, right? With the, with the combined oh, numbers. Sure, they're higher now, yeah. 
Yeah, no they're doubt. way higher now, right? You know, but like what the combined number is then versus now, I'm not I'm not yeah. entirely certain. I mean, I certainly hope I, I certainly hope so. I mean, I think that the Can um, you speak anecdotally your own sales? How it sure. cuts audio uh, versus physical? Yeah, well actually uh yeah. Actually I need to get some of those audio audio adaptations as we were talking, I was just thinking about that, that, like, that, they, that was like stalled for a long time and I need to, I need to get on that, but I have a, but, but yeah, look, I, I think that that's, uh, uh, certainly, you know, so I can certainly speak like, yeah, Kindle versus physical, but yeah, look, I, I think, uh, but I, I think that that is, you know, I'm sure a lot of people do. And I think that could be, you know, that could be good and bad. And, and I actually think sometimes, uh, with the right reader, an audio book could, you know, could disguise not amazing prose, you know. Uh, sure. And, uh, yeah, with the right reader, that's a very good point. Yeah. You know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, look, I certainly, I know anecdotally, I mean, I listen to a lot of audiobooks because I mean, I, I drive a lot and, you know, and it's, and, and I don't have as much time to read as I'd like. And so that, you know, I end up doing plenty of that, you know. And also, you know, you, there's only so much time you can spend listening to podcasts before you get it, before you, you, uh, mm. you want to do something else, right? It's like, yeah, uh, you, you do get a malaise of them. You know, it could be a little bit like, you know, I, I, uh, at a certain point, right? Yeah. You could just feel like you're just eating cotton candy all the time, you know? So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think that's, uh, I think that's right, you know, and, and, um, you know, and, and actually that is something, you know that is something that uh uh you know that Hitchens managed to get in on uh, a little bit you know i think that i believe so i know god is not great and i think also hitch 22 you know there are uh audiobook versions where where he read you know he read them which is uh in for you know for many authors would not be a selling you know a selling point that like i get to you know i get to hear the author read it you know but uh in his case certainly oh, is right? absolutely it's, is you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's bring it back to the man of the hour then. Um, yeah. So Hitchens was much more than Iraq and religion. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of his other books, you know, The Missionary Position, one of the greatest book titles of all time, about yes. Mother Teresa, uh, yes. The Trial of Henry Kissinger, um, mm-hmm. something about the monarchy. I forget what it's called. Can you uh, it's me? actually just called, yeah. So the main title is actually just The Monarchy. It's uh, The Monarchy, uh, a... It's either a, the monarchy, Britain's favorite fetish, or the monarchy, a critique of Britain's favorite fetish. But oh, okay. I thought either it was way, you get the idea. Blood, like blood and other something. Anyway, oh, it okay. Matter. So, 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 yeah. I think the so there's a different Hitchens book that uh, that's uh, depending on which edition you're looking at. I, I think one of them may be U.S. and one of them might be U.K. But it's either mm. blood class and empire, or blood that's class and nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and nostalgia exactly. And then as well. Yeah. Um, the triangulations of William Jeff- Jefferson Clinton, no one left to lie to. So he had yeah. a lot of work completely outside of religion and Iraq, uh, the reasons that yeah. he's remembered as. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, and I mean, we kind of referred to this earlier, but I should also say that whereas the kinds of books that you're mentioning are are the ones that, you know, I'm most familiar with and interested in and, you know, that I talk about in my book, um, I should also say that... Um, you know, I mean, what he wrote more of than anything over the decades was essays of various kinds. And, um, and as, you know, and of course, again, you know, what I'm most familiar with is the political and then also religious ones. But, um, I mean, he almost had this whole other career as a literary critic, you know, that they, <laughs> like, uh, if you, if you had, uh, you know, and some of that is anthologized, there's a book called, uh, Unacknowledged Legislators, uh, which is from a quote from Shelley, I think that you know poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. That's nothing but that's nothing but a uh, uh, a collection of of his literary criticism. And there's also and you know some of the later anthologies. There's quite a bit of that mixed in, you know, to uh, to to some of them along with the political ones. But um, but yeah, I, I mean the the man was yeah was absurdly prolific and in, in many different ways. Uh, I did. Um, you know, when I was, uh, I, I kind of, my resolve didn't, didn't really hold on this point, but when I started to write the book, you know, like one of my original goals was to 
not even mention either a rock or atheism until like a good way through the book, you know, <laughs> okay, uh, <I> cause, <laughs> you know, just cause, just cause most people, you know, those are the things, you know, if you only know a little bit about Christopher Hitchens, most likely, mm. you know, what you know falls into those For categories. Sure. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so, um, and then, um, and then some of the, um, you know, which I, I guess I'm more or less held to it on the Iraq part that that doesn't, that sort of doesn't get mentioned at all until, you know, a few chapters into the book and, and, and then, and then it sort of goes away again until later in the book. But it um, rightly deserves a lot of attention. Sure. I mean, obviously it's an incredibly important part of the story, yeah, right? I mean, yeah. you, you, you can't not talk about it, but I also, but I think that most people, especially most people with my politics, um, you know, they sort of, uh, if they're talking about Hitchens, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, oh, yeah. All a rock all the time, right? You know, yeah. and, and I didn't want to do that, right? I, I <laughs> all a rock all the be, time. That's a good line. You know, <laughs> you know, it would be more interesting to. I mean, part of the reason I wrote the book in the first place is that my hope was that you know, since you know, at this point we're you know, several months past the ten year mark of uh, of his death, and uh, and my hope was that that was enough time that's gone by a little over a decade that. Um, that I think some of the immediate passions of how people felt about him, you know, when he was alive have, have cooled down a little bit. And, and my hope was that a lot of people might be a little bit more open to a sort of more balanced assessment of, um, of what was, you know, what was good and bad about the, the bad of his ideas that, you know, that isn't just sort of, you know, I, I mean, I feel like we have, um, you know, we've already heard quite a bit from, uh, in various forms, not book form to be fair, but like, you know, but in various forms from, from people who, who think he was just right about everything. Uh, and, uh, and we've, um, and then like, you know, and then we've, we've already had for some time, you know, the, the sort of views of people who, um, like, what if, you know, what if, like, considering how prominent a figure he was at the end, right? There have been surprisingly few books, uh, entirely about him that have come out since then, but like, out of the ones that, that have right i mean like the the one from like a lefty kind of perspective which was not long after he died like 2013 or something like that i believe you know was um the richard seymour's book uh uh unhitched you know which is which which is definitely very focused on the the late foreign policy positions and even though one of the things i wanted to do with the book was to try to uh understand a little bit more how he got there that because uh, because I, I my feeling was that a lot of the stories that you know would be told by people who like me really disagree with those late positions uh are maybe so tinted by like anger from you know from the heat of those debates that they that they just don't have anything very plausible to say about why he got how he got there right i wanted to i wanted to try to i wanted to try to sort of understand a little bit more without just sort of saying oh he sold out or oh you know it was it was just islamophobia or whatever like i wanted to understand how he could have gotten himself to the point where he was he was taking those positions that is definitely part of what i wanted to do with the book but also part of what i wanted to do with the book is is just to um to talk about this whole body of work that that can't be uh that can't be reduced to that that the that like i that that i think does include a lot that rewards the engagement of people who who might uh who might really disagree as i do you know with some of those late positions yeah uh yeah the i think the islamophobia slur is like quite unfair those who level it against him you know um he was he yeah was, he was he was committedly anti-religious and yeah 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 i mean <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the yeah i mean he i think that the things that you could say in criticism of of his comments about islam you know are anything you could say about that that's like oh he's like lumping you know he's like lumping too much together into like one one big thing that you know that that he's, he's sort of evaluated all at once that he's assigned it sort of too much importance and like causing bad things that might have more complicated historical explanations anything like that you could say you could also say about christianity right i yeah. mean that the uh, the way the way that he wrote about that so uh i and i also think really specifically on the connection between the um you know real or alleged islamophobia and the um you know and and the war positions um as much as it is true right i think that the thing that you could say 
in criticism of Hitchens along these lines that, you know, I would at least agree with is that I do think it's true that like in the aftermath of 9-11, I do think he dramatically overestimated the realistic threat that like Al Qaeda style terrorism could pose to Western societies. Not exactly a unique Christopher Hitchens problem, right? I mean, that was kind of everybody in that, uh, in that sure, era, yeah. but like, you know, if you want to, um, you know, if you want to call that Islamophobia, I won't fight you on it, but the reason I don't think Islamophobia goes very far as an explanation of the uh, positions on Iraq and Afghanistan is that uh, the first, if you actually look at the history of, of his evolution on foreign policy, um, a lot of this comes before the point where people who were only paying a little bit of attention to him sort of started to notice the shift, which was 9-11 at the beginning of the you know so-called war on terror. Uh, and you have to look back at the 90s. So in the 90s, you know, it's this transitional period in his views about foreign policy. He'd been spending the 80s, you know, writing about, you know, Reagan and the dirty wars in Latin America and all that. Mm. Um, and even at the beginning of the 90s, he was he was very much opposed to the first Gulf the War. The first Iraq War. Uh, He's got that great interview with Charles Heston. Charles Heston, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keep yeah, your hairpiece you would... on. <laughs> yeah, funny. yeah, he's... And yeah, that he uh, at a certain point of the interview, he demands that uh, Heston tell him uh, which uh, to list off the countries that surround Iraq, and uh, and he can't Bahrain. do it. Like yeah, which the is countries island, that border yes. Bahrain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, and he's as like, oh, you want to bomb it, and you don't even know where it is. <laughs> you know, yes, which exactly. is you know, it's, it's, it's great Hitchens contempt, right? So mm-hmm. then, like. Okay, so what changes between that and 9-11? I mean, it's not like the way sometimes you see people talk about this. It's almost like, you know, I don't know. He had some lost weekend in September 2001, and at the end he'd sobered up and realized that he'd said a bunch of pro-war things or something. It's like, (laughs) no, this is a long process of, like, the evolution of his views. Uh, And uh, and the first war where he... um, he's really starting to warm up to the possibility that in his view, the United States military could be a force for good in the world is not actually one where the U S is bombing Muslims. It's one where the U S is intervening on the side of Bosnian uh, Muslims against uh, Serbian Christians. Uh, And then another important, you know, and then that's reprised with Kosovo in 1999. And then another part of this evolution that's, that's equally important, I think, in understanding where he ended up is that, after the Folsh Gulf War, which, as we said, he opposed, uh, he spent time in Iraqi Kurdistan, and uh, and he, you know, he got to know you know Kurdish leaders there, who some of whom had been you know '70s radicals themselves and could speak to Hitchens in his own language, <laughs> and uh, and and could could be very convincing, right? And uh, and and obviously. You know, those Kurdish leaders in, in northern Iraq, you know, uh, you know, for for reasons that require no explanation, you know, what it's Saddam Hussein gone, you know, and and uh, and so I think that that, you know, that like, you know, had an effect on his views. And by the end of the decade before 9-11, like if, if you read the book you mentioned earlier, the anti-Clinton book, No One Left to Lie To, um, which is a book I love, you know, but uh, in um uh, in in some ways, you know, is, yeah, it's definitely one of my favorites of his. Uh, but um, you know, for one thing, because it's it's one of the few places where he's really talking in depth and with great passion about sort of uh, domestic, um, like economic policy, you know, healthcare and welfare and all that, you know. But um, but there's an Iraq chapter in No One Left to Lie To. Oh wow! Well. That um, you know where he's talking about Clinton's, you know, policies in Iraq and he does not say it like, and a sort of normal leftist reader who's reading along with the book and likely agreed with everything up until that chapter, uh, will be very surprised by what he says there. Right. Because he's not taking the sort of, you know, Chomsky position you might expect based on, you know, sort of the general tenor of everything he's said so far, which has been criticizing Clinton for the left. Uh, if anything, his his criticism of Clinton is like he's too soft on Saddam Hussein, and uh, and so you 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 read that you wonder it's like okay well if there had been an invasion of Iraq four years earlier, you know pre nine eleven would he have supported that he might have actually right and and I think that uh, so I, I all of which is just to say none of this leads me to think well he got this right right you know I I, I agree with these these positions I don't but I also think that. There's something much more complicated and much more interesting going on than just than just saying like, oh well, he hated Muslims and like that's why that's why he uh, 
that's why he supported these wars. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously the Kurdish population north of Iraq is, you know, even though it's, you know, like there's probably a higher proportion of secular people, whatever, but I mean, it's a obviously overwhelmingly Muslim uh, society. Yeah, uh, he wore uh, the l- Kurdish flag on his lapel for like the last five years of his life. Yeah, and every exactly. moment, every opportunity he could take, he would mention them. Yeah, no, exactly. So, so I, I, I think, and I think this, this does tie in to some of what we were talking about earlier because I think that, uh, I think that a lot of my, um, uh, contemporaries, uh, comrades. Yeah, 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 yeah. To use a Hitchensism, uh, comrades and friends, yeah. right? That's, you know, like always part yeah. of his his crowd work, even if he was like Amazing. doing a god, doesn't matter doing who god, it is. Yeah. Doesn't matter who it is. It could be like a a, a God debate in some yeah. evangelical university in the yeah. deep south and he would still start, you know, ladies and gentlemen, friends. comrades and friends. Comrades. <laughs> yes. uh, Rather terse but, introduction, I would say. Suspiciously terse. He would always say like yeah. some of these things. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So um and you know, and I think yeah, I think a lot of my friends and comrades on uh, on the left I think have a bad habit of attributing um attributed disagreement and especially defection to uh to like just bad moral character right like that that's the that that's like the only acceptable explanation that you know that like and i think it i think it's unfortunate because i think it makes people stupider than they need to be because they they end up like sort of having this having this view of the world where it's like everybody secretly understands that we're right but like some of them are like taking money to like pretend, you know, to pretend that we're wrong, or maybe they're just sincere. But if so, it must be because they're incredibly racist. And either way, I just I just don't think that's helpful. I think that it's I think I don't think it's accurate, and I I certainly don't think it it is a helpful way to think about this stuff if you're in the persuasion business because because um, if you don't make any effort to think your way into other people's heads and see what motivates them and what, you know, what leads them to take the positions that you take that, I mean, you're just not going to be able to talk to people who, who don't start out agreeing with you. So to add a little bit more context sure. to Hitchens, yeah. the character yeah, beyond yeah. what I'm assuming a lot of the audience might certainly know the famous hitch slap videos and perhaps <laughs> a minority of the audience read hitch 22. Um, but you know, he's an interesting guy. He had a very interesting childhood, just given his relationship with his mother versus his father. Uh, so in Hitch 22, you know, his first memories are of a, a perfect blue as he's sailing into Valletto, this Maltese harbor. Can you talk about Portsmouth, Avon, the commander, and then his early reputation at Oxford? Yeah, so... Uh, so... Just to maybe go into that, you know, that second to last item, right? You know, uh, the so his father, you know, the uh, the commander um, who uh, was was this this very, um, you know, old fashioned conservative kind of military commander. I think I, I, you know, ironically enough, I think I think his great moment in uh, in World War Two was actually as as part of a operation that was essentially british military assistance to uh to the soviet union you know in in uh, in, in the fight against hitler so uh oh I think, no uh, really you know so uh, out. yeah yeah so i i think that he uh well sometimes he talks about it but depends on the uh depends on the occasion of the part sure, of his life when yeah. he's talking about it but you know he um so uh so yeah this 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 his uh old conservative military father you know was 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 uh you know, his, his great moment of, of glory was, uh, you know, helping Stalin. But uh, in any case... Uh, but sinking but a Nazi the, warship. Yeah, yeah, sink, exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which they would, like, celebrate the anniversary of every year. And, you know, it's certainly... Uh, I think earlier, you know, you gently and correctly sort of tapped out on trying to do psychology from uh, from a distance, you know, <laughs> and... Um, and so I, I won't indulge that too much here, but it is interesting to think about, you know, with with regard to his later shifts on foreign policy, whether there is some part of him that, um, you know, I don't, well, I don't think it's to un- make daddy happy. It's not that simple. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that it's, I don't think it's uncommon that as people get older, if they had, if they find themselves, if they find themselves like moving towards like what their parents thought, that's right, not always right. done. You know, that's that's something that you know. 
there's, there's a strange sort of satisfaction that could give that could give people and I, I don't exempt myself from that you know but interesting uh, very interesting yeah I mean uh, is... but uh, you know I'm not I, again as we discussed above I wouldn't put that much causal you know importance mm-hmm. on that I just think it's interesting to think about but um, but yeah so uh, Hitchens uh, so yeah his father is this naval commander I think that the I think the you know the uh, the cities you mentioned, I mean, you know, you could probably tell me more about them than vice versa, but I think that the, but I think that the sort of existence of the family in the very early years, I think, you know, upwardly mobile, lower middle class, you know, is, is probably fair, right? You know, there's a moment in Hitch 22 where, um, you know, Hitchens recalls uh, listening to his parents argue about whether to send him to, uh, uh, you know, when, public or private you know, school yeah yeah exactly you know what what uh what, what you you would co- confusingly call public school but exactly, you, know, yeah. uh, you know you know private boarding school and uh and and the commander is a little worried about money and and uh and uh his uh his mother uh who's ironically emerges later as as as, as kind of this bohemian you know free mm. spirit but you know mm. his his mother a, a hippie his, maybe yes yeah. yes yes exactly right his mother is um uh, insistent that they that they sent him, and and the line that that uh, that very young Christopher remembers hearing is, "If this country is going to have a ruling class, I want Christopher to be part of it." <laughs> Great line. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so he he goes off to, uh, uh, you know, he goes off to uh, to boarding school, and then afterwards uh, he's at Oxford. Uh, the um, uh, so the thing that's probably a little bit more so. At the time it was published, that it would be that in his twenty two salacious is is that you know is is basically his his you know talking about having sex with men you know at uh, you know at boarding school at Oxford, uh, uh, which um, uh, you know in fact there's a very funny line later on where he he's talking about his you know. The fact that you know his sex life after a certain point in his twenties or whatever is purely hetero, and you know, and he, and he says, you know, by that I was so ugly that only women would fuck me. But, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but then, uh, but I, I think the thing that maybe is the most interesting point to come in on, as far as those early that early time at, at Oxford, um, beyond mentioning that, um, I mean. That, you know, I think what his mother said about the ruling class, I mean, like, does give you some sense of who he's going to school with, uh, which, you know, includes, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, one of these anonymous men that, you know, he had affairs with as, uh, you know, I think he cryptically refers to as, as, as having been like a Tory cabinet member later. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, you know, you can, um, you know, he's, you know, there's a uh, uh, Bill Clinton. You know, is at Oxford at the same time as him as a as a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, so so Hitchens reports that uh, Clinton was technically telling the truth when he said he did not inhale. He said uh, he uh, uh, young Bill preferred edibles. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I think the I think the most interesting thing tied into all this that you could say about the early time at Oxford maybe is that as he becomes political, which has happened by the time he's left you know boarding school, that uh, that that he's sort of at the you know he's at the very least some kind of very left wing social democrat. You know he's uh, you know well, he's a, his friend James Fenton. I'm just trying to find the exact quote. Yeah, but he basically described him as as the revolutionary spirit at Oxford. I don't yeah, know how so much that's of an that Oxford. is. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, you're not o- there yet. Forgive me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no problem. So I mean, like he's, he says, so it's 1964. I think actually might be before he was a student at, you know, Balliol College at Oxford, but, you know, but I think it was, it was at Oxford is when it takes place, right? You know, he, he was at some meeting and he'd Where, like, already been- like politics enters his life. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, and, and he's, and he's already been like, by this point, he's already been pretty centered on politics uh, for a little while. It is this sort of way where he's a member of the labor party or possibly the labor party youth group. Uh, and, um, and he's definitely on the left wing of it. You know, he's, he's definitely going to, to anti-war protests. Uh, and then, um, but then he's recruited by an organization called the international socialists. I think just before he actually starts up, you know, school at Oxford, um, which is, um, you know, I, I think that the sort of exact, 
genealogy of splits and fusions of the British far left is probably something we don't need to get that far into, but I think Trotskyist is a good enough description uh, that it's a, but I, I think the important thing about it, uh, uh, you know, understanding this, this group and, and what it says about Liz politics were that is that it's, a radical socialist group, certainly far to the left of the mainstream of the Labour Party, uh, and extremely anti-war, etc. But that it's equally critical of both sides of the Cold War. Uh, that um, you know, it's it's not at all you know uh, your sort of Moscow apologist flavor of of uh, of, of socialist revolutionary. Uh, that the the slogan of the group is neither Washington nor Moscow, but international socialism. Uh, and so later on, skipping ahead a few years, and we'll go back, but, you know, like later on in 1968, when almost simultaneously there is a general strike and student uprising in France that almost brings down the de Gaulle government, and uh, there is a kind of reformist experiment in Czechoslovakia, the Prague Spring, that's uh, that's crushed, you know, crushed by Soviet tanks. Uh, they're, they're kind of equally all over both of those, right, you know, because they, they see that as as... Uh, as signs of, you know, revolutionary discontent from the world's working classes against against the establishment, both East and West, right? So that's where his politics are at. And the really interesting thing to tie into some of what I said earlier, I think, about his early time at Oxford is that on the one hand, uh, he he is this, you know, bright-eyed young Marxist revolutionary. You know, he's, he's, he's going to anti-war protests all the time. He's... Uh, uh, he he flies off to Cuba at one point during this period to be part of this internationalist youth conference, and uh, while he's there, he uh, he distributes some Spanish language leaflets, uh, you know, uh, denouncing the uh, the the crushing of the Prague Spring. Uh, so that's that's one Hitchens persona. But on the other hand, he's he's. Uh, you know, he's partying with some pretty right wing aristocrats because he just thinks they, you know, he just like like likes them better socially. You know, <laughs> 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 isn't that hilarious? Yeah, <laughs> like having it both ways. Uh, <laughs> like very champagne socialist. In fact, uh, Martin Amos says um, exactly on that point uh, when you know he calls him out. Like, come on, you're being a <laughs> hypocrite here. He says, and Hitchens responds. Well, why should they have all the champagne? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. And- <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and, you know, and I should say, so, like, this is, you know, I think there's this way that people who sort of know the a few of the Hitchens' greatest hits perceive his political evolution over the course of his life, where it's like, it kind of skips straight from being a 1970s Trotsky to uh, to to being you know whatever you want to call him in the 2000s and neocon. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, which is which is sort of a. Um, I mean, it's kind of funny. I I mean, I joke about this a little bit in the book, and then the review and Quillette that you mentioned earlier sort of took this passage very literally. Hmm. Uh, that they that like. You know, I, I I sort of did this well. You know, I guess you could say he's a neocon except blood this and that and then you know the other thing, all the positions that don't fit. You know, and, 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 well, how can you be a neocon if you? So, oh, okay. Uh, but, you know, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, he has positions on Palestine, on torture, on surveillance that you know mm. that that are are and you know, not you know that are very hard. You know, fits with the the neocon. Uh, you know image which which does tell me there's something more complicated and interesting going on there that you know if he'd lived longer i mean he might have continued to move i mean i'm sure he would not have stayed exactly where he was mm. you know we could only speculate about where he might have moved politically in the in the remaining 10 years but in between the international socialist period at oxford and becoming um you know this this sort of very ambiguous kind of sort of neocon in the uh, in the two thousands. You know uh, who also spent all of his time uh, uh, arguing about religion. Uh, you know during the Bush administration. Uh, the um, you know in between, I think there's um, you know there are decades of political evolution there, uh, and you know certainly by some time in the seven mid seventies, you know he's you know he quits the IS sort of international socialists. Yeah, you know, he so he leaves that organization partially because of, you know, faction fighting that, you know, would not probably be worth it to try to figure out what they were even fighting about. He, he even he even says uh, why in Hitch 22 um, that the yeah. old cliche was true, you know, too many meetings and too little action, basically. 
yeah, and I think that's like the deeper reason that it's like okay, so there's like some factual disputes that are going on at the time, but like I think at a on a bigger level, like I think this he's just kind of decided this is not for him. Mm. Uh, that, that and he, he also like he had just so much disappointment. I can only imagine because I'm not that ideologically uh, uh, bent. You know, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't invest myself necessarily in a movement which Hitchens clearly did, you know, he was everything in, in it and to see it sort of crumble in front of him and, and not turn out to be the revolutionary moment that he wished he would be a part of. Um, perhaps well, it, you know, like made him a bit resentful and jaded. Yeah. I think that's the thing. Cause like um, by the mid seventies, I think he realized, I mean, I think he says this about as many words on Hitch 42 and other places that, you know, 1968 was really, you know, at least for the moment, the end of something. It wasn't the beginning of something like he thought for for years that it was, mm. and that there there was not going to be at any time in the foreseeable future, right? Some some great no revolutionary revolution. wave, right? Yeah. You know that that wasn't going to happen, right? So, uh, you know, he's he's kind of reconciled himself to the realities of that. He still has the uh, which which is enough to you know, mean that he just does not have the fire in his belly to like spend all of his time going to meetings and arguing, you know, that that's, that's just not interested in him anymore. Right. Sure, but, yeah. um, but, you know, he does retain, you know, the basic, uh, at least political goals or ideals that he always had, even if he doesn't think that there's going to be some great revolutionary tumult mm-hmm. in the near future, that's going to bring it all into being. Right. So like, um, uh, until the end, he admired Marx. Like he always spoke with him in, in deferential terms. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I, I mean, there's sort of, there are points in the last few years of his life where he sort of, you know, playfully says things like, you know, where, what am I politically? Well, I'm a very conservative Marxist, you know, that, uh, <laughs> by, by which, you know, I, I, I think what he really meant more than anything was just that he had, um, you know, he no longer identified with an ongoing, with like a socialist political project that he thought mm. was a real historical possibility. Um and, you know, clearly not, right? I mean, given some of his political positions the last years. But uh, he still thought that, you know, Marxism as a sort of way of understanding the world and his way of understanding history was, like, mostly correct, you know, and, 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 and a sort of useful prism for, for understanding all of that. I mean, I think that mm-hmm. was his, his combined position. And I think there's some real tensions there, you know, about, like, whether everything that he thought really fit that or not, right? You know, but I don't think that... I don't think that means he was insincere. I think that just meant that, like, he had complicated feelings about this stuff that hadn't entirely resolved themselves. You know, in the post Trotskyist period, you know, he rejoins the Labour Party, uh, which he'd, he'd been, you know, kicked out of, you know, for 60s revolutionary protest kinds of reasons. And um, and he, he does continue to think of himself as some kind of socialist and to... Uh, you know, say very radical things whenever he's describing the sort of long-term horizons of his politics up until, you know, about the end of the 1990s. And then I think that that, you know, I think that that his sort of, like, the other shoe kind of dropping as far as, like, um, okay, this is really, in his mind at this point, just much more off the table historically than he thought, than he even thought in, like, the 80s or, you know, early 90s, I think is also part of what helps you to understand how he shifted later because, you know, I mean, again, like he, he cares what happens to people like these Iraqi Kurds. He cares what happens to people who are living under despotic regimes. And if, um, you know, if, if socialist revolution isn't on the table, you know, then, then at least, you know, at least liberal democratic revolution is better than nothing. And, Mm. uh, uh, and, and, you know, and then the sort of, uh, the real, you know, step over the abyss from a left-wing anti-war perspective is is thinking that the that like the united states could be a, a vehicle of you know spreading democratic revolution in, into yeah. those countries but you know but i think whatever you think of the conclusion i think it's a much more interesting story than just like you know um like hitchens the trotskyist uh like somehow you know uh like somehow overnight, you know, on September 12th, you know, uh, decides to, you know, decides to change all of his political opinions. Mm. Um, on to, to, to compliment, no, not to compliment. Yes. To compliment that theme ish. Uh, there yeah. is another great Martin Amos quote. And again, Martin yeah. Amos is his best friend. Um, yeah. like they had such, just speaking about it is, um, 
you know, the type of friend who Martin says as well, you know, you could really say anything. You could reveal right. the deepest, weirdest parts of yourself and feel no shame. And, um, you know, like good friendship type stuff. And maybe sure. there was a little bit of, well, that's, just, that's not important. So, um, sure. Martin also described, you know, his greatest friend, Christopher Hitchens, as strongly ideological. And he was always looking for ideologies to hitch his wagon onto. And so, and then he actually goes on to say, and this largely describes his peculiar stance on Iraq. Uh. And, you know, you sort of just laid out how perhaps his revolutionary dream sort of fell Uh. apart. And then what's the next thing you're going to do? Well, you know, the, the irony of writing the trial against Henry Kissinger or the case against Henry Kissinger and then being, you know, like America yeah, is yeah. actually the policeman of the world and, you know, they're going to do a fine job. Uh, right. it, it, you know, Martin describes it, someone who knew him better than anyone, perhaps Carol Blue knew him better, maybe his kids, but someone who knew really better than yeah, anyone. Yeah. It's just as simple as that. He needed an ideology to, to, to energize him, you know, to get behind. Um, and that's like a personality trait, right? Like not everyone's necessarily like that. Yeah, I think that, well, that last part is certainly true. Yeah, I mean, I think that, and I think that's right. I mean, I think that he could, um, like, I, I I, mean, I do think he was clearly somebody who was invigorated by connections to, to great causes, Um and, you know, again, if, if you want to uh, psychologize a little bit and, you know, at least take, uh, <laughs> you know, Martin Davis, you know, as, as a good source on that, you know, like I, I, I think that, that that is also perhaps an explanation of part of why he's uh, latching as hard as he is to uh, uh, atheism in the, in the final years. You know, I mean, I think that there is a partially ideological explanation to that in terms of what was some of what was going on in the world. But also I think that. You know, there's there's a if if he sort of needs to orient himself towards something that he could get morally excited about, uh, as as a big part of how he you know he worked and you know wrote and spoke and related to the world, then you know I think maybe especially as um, that you know neocon uh, you know project of uh, of of supporting what he thought were going to be wars of liberation in the Middle East. Um, you know, lost some of its luster, you know, uh, after, you know, in, um, in the second half of the two thousands, you know, I mean, it, it makes, you know, I mean, it makes sense on that level that, you know, that, that he would, I mean, you know, God, if you want to, if you want a grandiose target to, uh, uh, you know, to, to get excited about crusading against, you know, then like God, uh, you know, is a, uh, is a pretty good, uh, is a pretty good candidate for that, mm. you know? So, uh, so you could, you know, you could, you can see that, right? I mean, does he want to spend all of his time arguing about, um, you know, Iraq, which, you know, he, he certainly could never bring himself to say, no, that was a bad idea. We shouldn't have done that, you know, but he, but he does, um, you know, it, it, it does make a certain amount of sense to me that, you know, that he could, he could find some, some renewed excitement, you know, arguing about religion. Mm. We spoke about the commander and wow. life up until Oxford and then after. But what about his relationship with his mother, Yvonne? Mm. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I mean, this is, does seem to be somebody who, who may have been much more of a, of an influence on him in an obvious way, certainly in, you know, certainly for the first several decades of his life, you know, than, than his father, you know, since, since, uh, he's, um, you know, I, I mean, I remember, you know, in history too, he talks about having, um, uh, you know, with the, you know, Falklands are, you know, if the Falklands war is going on and, and he's, um, and, uh, and he, you know, and, and this is like, you know, very, very early preview, you know, of which there wouldn't be another one for, for many years afterwards of his willingness to support, uh, you know, to, to compromise his usual anti-interventionism, you know, in, in this case. And also a contrarian thing to do, to almost just <laughs> intentionally piss people off. Yeah, yeah fair. So uh, he does, 
Uh, and I mean, his his argument in that case is is is, is that it would be um, is that the uh, you know the the military junta that was running Argentina would be more likely to be brought down if they if they lost a war. Um, and you know that's uh, which you know give credit where credit's due. I think probably held up better than most of his uh, you know most of his predictions about how uh, how how inter- you know, foreign interventions would go. But I think. Um, but like, but I do remember he says that like I think he like made a point of like showing you know the commander the the articles he'd written because I think he was probably happy. It's like oh, hey, look for once I'm writing something you'll agree with, you know, All right, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, that's you know. But uh, uh, but yeah, I I think that uh, but yeah, I mean I suspect that that Yvonne uh, being a bit of a hippie uh, and you know and ultimately um, you know ultimately leaving his father and you know and. and all that, I mean, was, was probably, you know, probably more of a kindred spirit and, and, uh, and, and more of a, more of an influence. Uh, although, you know, she dies in this kind of ambiguous suicide, murder, suicide, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit hard to, you know, to, to know what happened there, uh, with, with the, uh, with the man she, you know, she'd left, uh, she'd left the commander for, uh, when Hitchens is still uh, is still very young, I mean, I think what what would that be like his early twenties? I want to say twenty five, but twenty five sounds right. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense because that would be the because that was around the time of the uh, he, the, he was just Eastern cutting Portugal. himself out as a figure in London, just out of Oxford. Yeah, yeah, uh, which um, you know, which which what exactly he you know he kind of made of that you know and and how how that you know, might have influenced him going forward is a little bit, you know, is a little bit hard to say. I mean, he writes about that in a very raw way and mm. in, in Hitch 22, you know, but he doesn't, um, you know, and, and he, you know, but like, I think the way he's portrayed himself, which is actually, I think part of what makes that a good book that he has, um, you know, that I think he, he has enough distance when he's writing about his, his younger self that he can both sort of, you know, get excited again about some of the things that got him excited then, but like also I don't think he feels too much need mm. to either like, you know, either defend or apologize for, you know, like 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 any of what he, you know, like any of what he was like at twenty five. I mean I think I think he could just kind of appreciate it for what it is and, you know, and so I think he I think he could write about himself at that age almost like he almost like he's writing about a character in a novel. Uh and so you know, he he kind of talks about how he's he's going to. Um, that is Lisbon, right? Where where Yvonne was when, when she when she died. Oh, it was okay. Sorry. So um, no, Athens. Athens. Okay. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Because he's I, overlooking I, the Parthenon, I, I, and there is. I'm some mixing up my uh, my revolutionary revolution tumults of the yeah. of the uh, yeah. I'm mixing up my mid seventies uh, European revolutions. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's there we go. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Which is which is also um, you know we should also mention that um, uh, his uh, his very first book uh, was was about the uh, the mm. Parthenon uh, the Parthenon marbles. Um, uh, you know, and 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 the sort of case for uh, for for returning them Returning, to uh, to yeah. Greece, um, which uh, which he uh, you know, um, you know is you know is sort of, I I think interested as like as as a first book that you know that it sort of both gets into the, you know I mean it's it's both a sort of manifestation of the of the lefty anti imperialism but it's also um. You know, but I think it's it's also just not a book most people would have written, uh, and it's it, it's got no commercial <laughs> value at all. But it's fascinating <laughs> right. and it's interesting, and it's like uh, this is those sort of decisions. Uh, I think personally, why I just like him so much, I sort of see that range of eclectic curiosities and, uh, and, and commitment to like actually answer a question that could just be passing, like yeah. Um, it's very admirable, at least. I don't know. Yeah, this is my projection. Yeah, but, but yeah. no, no, I, I'm with you. But I also think that the okay. So it is interesting that it's I I, I mixed it up in my head and thought you know I was thought, thinking Portugal, but as you say that, I'm actually remembering that in those in those scenes in Hitch 22, he has, uh, he recalls 
right? So the the Greek you know generals are still very much in power because he recalls going to meetings where uh, people are like like whispering, you know, the international, you know, to like singing, you know, cause so, so as not to be, uh, so as not to be overheard. And he sort of has this little moment of self-consciousness as he's recounting this about the, the fact that his, you know, his mother has just died, you know, mm. that, that, that she's, you know, um, and that he's sort of off doing this like leftist revolutionary stuff, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, that, that he's, he's like combined that, you know, with, with going to see, see what had happened. And, um, you know, and I, I think a very different person with a very different trajectory, you know, you could imagine that being a moment of like, you know, I don't know, like political disillusionment, like what am I doing here, right? You know, that the, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, and, you know, and it is interesting that this is the same, you know, this this is very shortly, you know, I think before he, uh, you know, he leaves the International Socialists uh, that, you know, I mean, that is interesting to think about that, you know, maybe, you know, one last indulgence and, in, you know, it's psychologizing from a distance, but, you know, that, that maybe there's a, uh, um, you know, I could imagine something traumatic on that level, right? I mean, having your mother die in those circumstances, you know, while you're that age, you know, I mean, could yeah, make and, you uh, reevaluate your life a little bit and how much of it you wanted to spend in meetings. And especially sad feature to that anecdote as well is that there were, you know, the line, the phone was off the hook. Hitchens had right. missed calls you know, this is back in the 70s, so it, it's not easy to make an international phone call. Hitchens had a really close relationship with his mother. You know, she even presented right. this man to him before she went away to Athens, you know, sort of seeking out Christopher's approval. Like, hey, look, right. I've got a interesting, intelligent, you know, intellectual on my arm. Um, you must right. like him. And right. Christopher <laughs> giving him the, you know, sort of nod of approval. Like, all right, then. Um you know, it is, it, it's a very moving, cha- by far the most moving thing I've ever read from Hitchens, but it, it's not yeah. like he's writing for emotion most of the time, but uh, it really is yeah. moving. Like, you know, his relationship with his mother culminating in that fashion. Um, well, I will, I will just say in general, you know, as you say, he's generally not writing for for emotion, at least not in that sense, right? I mean, that the, that like he, for you drama, know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, usually he wants to, you know, maybe arouse your like moral passion about, you know, something that, you know, what what he's writing about, but he he doesn't, you know, he's you know he's not really writing in the vein of of arousing personal uh, emotions. Uh, but when you know, I mean, when he does, he's very good at it. He uh, he has yeah. uh, like I mean, I'm thinking here of like some of the last essays that he wrote before he died when uh, that are collected, and um, there's a little thin book called Mortality. You know that's that's basically about uh, his his experience with cancer, mm. and, it's and I amazing. think that, it really is amazing. Yeah, yeah, it is, and I think that he, I think that because you know, I I I think he has these kinds of aesthetic scruples about being you know sappy, you know mm. that uh, mm. that that he would you know he would do that. Uh, so so it some of it ends up being kind of understated in a way that actually makes it much more powerful 100 percent, yeah no he he didn't want to be uh he much in in fact this is an obscure connection but norm mcdonald who i'm not sure if you're familiar with Mm -hmm. him he's a comedian 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 yeah you know he i I was actually i was actually just thinking as i said that when i said experiences with cancer really okay uh, i was i was i was thinking of norm mcdonald's bit about the phrase battling cancer you know like you know his struggle against cancer Uh and and that's why i didn't use that phrase even though like it rises to your tongue because it's like such a it's it's the way we always talk about it right i mean it's so so it's 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 like oh after a long battle with cancer and he's like yeah no (laughs) uncle phil and then like i guess you know he lost he wasn't strong enough (laughs) (laughs) exactly like uh, the, the, the because Norm obviously passed away, I think, last year or the year before. And it reminded me of mortality and the way Hitchens yeah. spoke about cancer a lot as well. It, it's not this courageous battle. You know, you just right. try to poison yourself to try stop yourself from killing yourself. And the, like, uh, yeah, like that. I mean, the way he speaks about it. Oh, what is it? Oh, fuck. I can't remember what it is now. But he, he, he refers to cancer as a specific thing. And, you know, like one of the opening quotes is um in fact give me a minute i want to do you mind if i quickly look it up i've got it i've got it available quickly yep yep Yep. in fact that's actually the that is the book or the thing that i was introduced to hitchens through 
Mm. Uh, I was in this very obscure book. I was living in Tilburg in the Netherlands at the time. And I walked into this like, uh, uh, you know, dark arts, you know, sort of black magic bookstore. Very interesting, you know, uh, all these obscure books about Eastern philosophy and crystals and all sort of stuff. And sitting on the table being promoted is Mortality by Christopher Hitchens. And I thought, oh, this looks like an interesting read. And I just read it and thought, what an amazing book. And obviously then I discovered the YouTube and it's like, what a compelling right. speaker and Hitch 22. So I've more than once in my time woken up feeling like death, but nothing prepared <laughs> yes. me for the early morning in June when I came to consciousness feeling as if I were actually shackled to my own corpse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that is an amazing opening. I mean, that like kind of shocking laugh line, you know, about the, yeah. you know, waking up feeling like death, mm-hmm. and then the that analogy. Yeah, that's that is incredible. And, and, um, and on that day, he was to feature on John Stewart. He did. Right. On that day, he was to feature on stage with Salman Rushdie to promote Hitch Twenty Two, and Salman recalls the time Hitchens gave a terrific performance. No, sorry, not on that day. On a different day, when Hitchens was given the terminal. Uh, diagnosis he performs with Rushdie goes to a long dinner um, is the you know most interesting man in the room and that day he got given the terminal uh, diagnosis it's just so amazing you know and then this echoes Norm Macdonald a little bit you know I can't see myself whining about why it's all so unfair I've been taunting the reaper into taking a free scythe in my direction and have now succumbed to something so predictable and banal that it even bores me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah no that is yeah no yeah. exactly um and you know and, and also i should say that like I, I remember reading some of these essays uh slate i guess in um as there were you know like some of the ones that were previously published you know i remember reading some of them at the at the time and and uh, and being really moved by them you know which which is is part of why, uh, even though, um, you know, even though, uh, this is, you know, I, I'd kind of gotten the idea for the book and I'd had the, I'd had the contract approved before any of this happened. You know, I, I mean, I think, I think it was like very much on my mind, um, you know, when I was writing it because I had, you know, by the time that I was actually, you know, writing the book, um, you know, the the you know, the pandemic had happened. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, like I had, you know, whatever as as a as a good, uh, uh, you know, as a as a good member of my tribe. I'd, I'd, I'd spent a good year, you know, driving myself crazy by being inside, and I had uh, I'd I'd. Um, and also, uh, and also at that time, a, a very uh, a very good friend, a close collaborator of mine, had died unexpectedly. You know, the, the book is is to get dedicated to him, and um, and so the combination of those two things. I mean, I was probably thinking, you know, during the months when I was writing the book, I was probably thinking more about about mortality than that that I have at any previous point as an adult. You know that uh, you know that that I uh, that you know I mean the there is, you know, I mean, short of the eloquence of Christopher Hitchens, right? It's very, very hard to talk about this without being trite, but I mean, you have, uh, but, you know, but I mean, it, it, uh, it brought home the reality of that to me and, you know, in a way that it really had not been previously. And, um, and so I think that was, you know, part of why, you know, I think that was, I think that does factor into the fascination for, for Hitchens with me, both that he was somebody who had written so well about, you know, this time when he was dying, about the process of dying. And, uh, and also, you know, I mean, okay. You know, we, we, we said that, uh, the, the two topics people always think of when they think of Hitchens are Iraq and religion. And, you know, when we, we did Iraq and just to do religion very briefly, right. You know, I think that the, that, um, that is part, you know, like Hitchens in the final years, you know, even though I, I had, very deep political disagreements with where he was at that time, right? I mean, part of, 
you know, part of the fascination forms a figure for me besides that, you know, sort of Hitchens is a literary character and, you know, and, 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 uh, and all of that that we talked about before, uh, as this amazing writer and speaker and everything else, uh, is, uh, the way that he talked and wrote about religion, which, um, you know, which is something that I still find really interested that there's this way that I think some people have this, um, in my experience, anecdotally, I think that some people who are maybe interested in all of that in the late 2000s, the sort of heyday of, of new atheism, will sort of talk about it now in this, this sort of too, too cool for school way. You know, it's like, oh, they're just kind of bored by the whole subject now. And um, I don't get that, right? Because uh, I, I think whatever you can say, and I think there is a lot to say about what was good and bad about, you know, the, the sort of uh, new atheism heyday. Um uh, you know, the, the sort of core subject is one that I don't entirely understand how you can be a person and not be interested in because, you know, it, it is just one of the basic facts about being a person that you're going to die someday. Mm. And um, and so this, you know, dispute about whether, um, you know, that's it or not. And if that is that if that is it. Right. Which unfortunately, I think it is. Uh, you know what you kind of do with that, you know, and, and how you how you process with that, and how you live, and you know, and sort of knowledge of that, you know, I, I I just I I don't know. I'm a simple man. I find that pretty interesting. It's incredibly compelling, and it's uh, it's the source of either tremendous inspiration or like fear or helplessness or complete nihilism. I, I'm totally with you. It, it's completely fascinating to think about read about um it funnily enough norm mcdonald uh said that it was just by far the most important question and you know he said it in much funnier terms than that but like all science is stupid because they're not talking about the one question that actually matters <laughs> you know nothing else matters until you understand you're like are we the creation of something else and what happens once we die and if nothing happens when we die it's like how arbitrary is it to be here in this generation at this time yeah. uh what's the difference between me and uh, ten thousand years ago or ten thousand years in the future does anything i do now actually matter anyway they're gonna do it anyway yeah it, it, it's it's um i'm with you there uh very very fascinating and i suppose we got onto that because of hitchens writing about it, immortality which um i'll leave an article i'll leave a link to the article i wrote about the book which features just a, it's basically just you know highlighting passages from the book but people should also buy it and yeah you know it's uncompleted actually one of the you know one of the really sad parts about it is the last few chapters are just sort of sort of notes that are unconnected because these were the last things that the man wrote um and it's a shame he didn't get to finish it and uh but yeah i mean meditations on mortality uh are so fascinating i mean the one of the this isn't necessarily a meditation actually it is a meditation on mortality it's the final chapter of norm norm's book uh which mm -hmm. i forget what it's called but he wrote one book so people can find it the final chapter is actually a remarkably moving uh piece of writing which you wouldn't expect from a book that is largely just taking the piss and it's norm at the end just saying it goes really fast and yeah people are only going to remember him if they remember him at all for having been fired off SNL not even anything else and <laughs> to construct that emotion with good words it's it's uh it's it's, it's incredibly moving and it did remind me a lot of Hitch's mortality um I don't know yeah so If Hitchens, you 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 said before, you know it's it's an unfair question and it's also pure sure, speculation. Sure, sure. But if Hitchens sure. did, hard not to though. You know, win his fight against cancer, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, what do you suspect he would have made of the issues of the day? Now I have a list. I'll say them quickly and then uh, I'll just leave it with you. Sure, sure. Fake sure, news, we'll Trump, Brexit, Ukraine, wokeness, political extremes. Oh wow. Okay. Um... Well, I guess we'll start with the easy ones, uh, which, to my mind, the easiest ones on that list are um, 
uh, Brexit and Trump uh, because uh, and part of what makes it easy is that uh, is the the sort of some of the reasons that I think he would have been very you know anti-Trump and continued to be very anti-Brexit I mean he was he was opposed to the idea uh, you know when it when people were arguing about it you know many years before it happened mm. uh, and he identified as a European citizen right so I think a lot of the reasons that he took about those positions, not all of them, but a lot of them, I think, represented things that were common threads uh, between the different versions of Hitchens over the years. And so I have a very hard time imagining any version of Hitchens, which they didn't continue to be common threads. So um, I think that, you know, I think the range of political positions I could imagine um, Christopher Hitchens taking i mean there really is a range right because i think that there are things that are sort of consistent with impulses that he had at one time or another that might have led him in different directions um you know like i don't i have a very hard time imagining him ever you know saying oh never mind i was wrong about all that stuff in the early 2000s uh just as a matter of personality if nothing else uh you know like that that's and just the fact that it was such a sharp break you know with so many of his former comrades that like i, I think just psychologically that would have been really hard uh but uh but I, I can't imagine versions of hitchens who might have in some complicated way it would be despite stuff like that you know uh have warmed back up to um uh, have, might have warmed back up to the left to some extent. I think that it's. I think that it's possible. I speculate a little bit in the book. Um, you know, like if you think, I think in the British case it's a lot harder because, uh, you know, I, for better or for worse, uh, you know, I, 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 I think he would have really hated Jeremy Corbyn. But I think that in the, uh, uh, but I think in the American case, I think it, it is a little bit easier to imagine him maybe like, I don't think it's totally out of the question that he could have, you know, he could have like ended up as like a Bernie Sanders supporter in 2016, for example. I think that, you know, I think there are some reasons that I get into in the book why he might've done that, but that's like, so that's like one end of the range. Another end of the range is like, you know, just becoming in many ways, what we would think of as like a resistance lib, you know, in the uh, in the Trump in the Trump years, you know that the I think that there there are many things about Hitchens that might have been consistent with, you know, that the and and then like you one of your questions was about Ukraine, right? I mean, it's it's it does not stretch the imagination to imagine like Hitchens on TV like ranting about Vladimir Putin, and mm-hmm. you know, and and uh, you know, uh, in a way that's very consistent with uh, you know with the sort of tenor of 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 some of his his Bush era politics. Um, and so, and maybe even kind of on the, you know, Lincoln Project kind of end of the sort of like, you know, like Republican neocon never Trumper types, you know, that like, you know, having some affinity to that crowd, I mean, some of those people were his friends, right? So I mean, like, I, I could imagine that too, right? So I think there's like a range of political positions that I could imagine him taking. But I think one thing I absolutely can't imagine is him being friendly to Trump or Brexit for a lot of reasons. You know, I think that the, um, so yeah, I mean, you're kind of alluded to it in the, uh, in the Brexit case, uh, in 1999, the, uh, the first, you know, debate that he did with, uh, with Peter was essentially about that, you know, that the, uh, about whether it was, it was a good thing, you know, I mean, Peter is such a, you know, delightfully strange crank that I think he said he didn't actually vote in the Brexit referendum because he didn't like the, uh, uh, the people who were running the, you know, the leave campaign. Uh, but like, you know, Peter was certainly advocating the position the UK being part of the EU was a bad thing. And, he, you know, Christopher certainly disagreed with him. Uh, and, but I think that's, I think more generally that like the sort of specifics of that or the specifics of what he said about Trump, which, you know, he says um, in 2000, this is sort of, you know, lost to history. Uh, it's it's strange to remember that this happened, but when Trump was sort of a uh, semi-candidate, at least very publicly floating his candidacy for the uh, Reform Party nomination for president, uh, which ultimately ended up going to Pat Buchanan. Uh, but um, in his column for The Nation where he talks about that, uh, Hitchens refers to Trump as a nutball narcissistic tycoon. Uh, and um, he, he says elsewhere, 
uh, that the, as far as he could tell, the only impressive thing about that man is that he found a way to cover uh, 90% of his skull with 10% of his hair. I might be getting the percentages wrong, but it was along those lines. Uh, and, uh, and so he certainly like... In that same clip where he talks about covering his hair, he says, uh, you know, like, uh, really the only good thing about him is that he convinced that Slovenian uh, to be on his arm or something like that. <laughs> yeah, which is... Uh, which is funny, by the way, because because uh, speaking of Slovenians, he uh, uh, he did teach at the New School at the same time as uh, Slavoj Žižek did, uh, and um, oh, and wow. I talked to I talked to somebody who took classes from both of them, and uh, actually tried to arrange a debate between the two of them about Iraq, which apparently both of them were up for, but then the schedules never quite worked out, and then Hitchens got sick and whatever, which mm. uh, but that is some uh, lost YouTube gold right there, but uh, <laughs> without a doubt, yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, so he has uh, so so he certainly disliked Trump as a person, but I think there are deeper reasons than that that he would have virulently disliked, uh, you know, Trump and and uh, and also Brexit. You know that like I think I think okay, sort of somewhat staying with personality, but moving into politics. I think just like how aggressively and proudly just stupid like Trump's persona was. <laughs> uh would have uh w- you know would have been something he did not like and but also i think the political forces that trump was appealing to i mean he uh hitchens after 9 11 when he was already like advocating the invasion of afghanistan uh did a public debate on uh, reparations and also wrote an essay about it where he supported reparations for the descendants of slaves he uh uh there's a column in uh oh, what was it? i think 2009 uh, when Obama had just come into office and uh, Glenn Beck organized this rally at the Capitol uh, and uh, that uh, Hitchens refers to that rally as the water world of white self-pity. Uh, like it's, you know, I, 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 I think he wouldn't have been able to stand these guys. I, I think that that kind of the, I think the anti-immigrant rhetoric, I think, um, you know, kind of appeals to nativism. Um, you know, I mean, he, he says many times, many places that, you know, that like the, as far as he's concerned, like the two worst things are, you know, racism and religion. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think he wouldn't have been able to stand all of that. I think, a, you know, so I think he would have had like very good and honorable reasons for disliking all of that. But also I think that if he, if he'd had, you know, if his, you know, if his like interventionist foreign policy views had stayed in place, you know, which, which obviously I'm not crazy about, but I think that too would have led him to, um, to have, uh, to, to, to dislike Trump, because even though I would argue there's a big disconnect between Trump's actual record on the stuff and his rhetoric, uh, you know, I mean, if like Trump was, was at least sort of rhetorically appealing to kind of right-wing isolationism of the kind that Hitchens particularly hated, and and like to use as a foil for what he thought uh and you know i mean he even like you know i mean trump even like resuscitated the old Lindbergh slogan you know america first so uh so yeah i i think that i think i think on every level um i mean i think there's an interesting question about whether he could have like you know brought himself to hold his nose and vote for hillary clinton but the uh but like i i there's not a doubt in my mind that you know that that he would have uh he would have despised trump and that he you know and that he would have thought that you know, I mean, he he did think that the EU was like a sort of civilizing liberal influence, you know, on on the UK, and uh, and and I think the idea that, um, and I I think the idea that it would withdraw from it in this campaign for you know like this very right wing campaign that's like very mixed up with you know with um, um, uh, you know sentiment about uh about you know immigration and you know and and uh eastern european workers and all of that you know i i i think he i think he would have hated everything about it i uh, i know there was also some stuff about wokeness on on your list um i guess i guess i give a variation of the same answer i think that there are all right i think that i don't think that there's any version of hitchens that you could easily imagine who would have been you know describable as as woke right and it is is his affect i think he i think he would be uh you know i i i you know i think he kind of did hate the bigotins of all of that you know as, as he was perceiving them in the late 2000s mm-hmm. and i'm sure he would have continued to do so i i think that like he has going back to the 90s uh there's a interview with the progressive that is in that collection i mentioned earlier the last interview and other interviews where i think he says some very you know 
from my perspective, very good left wing Adolf Reedish things, you know, criticizing identity politics. Uh, and, and I think he, um, you know, and, and then I think he also just like, you know, just on a level of just kind of personality and cultural sensibilities and, and all that stuff. I mean, the idea of a version of, of Hitchens who's like, you know, very, very concerned with parsing people's statements to see if they said anything problematic, you know, I mean, like, like, yeah, he obviously would have hated all of that and, and, and he would have, you know, he would have probably been canceled numerous times, at least some of them unfairly, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and he was, you know, I mean, we talked a little bit about, you know, his, his issues with the word contrarian, but like, you know, I mean, look, I don't, Yeah, you know, he did write an article called Why Women Aren't Funny and, um, and followed and, it up with a video. <laughs> <laughs> followed it up with a video that's right yeah. you know and at no point did he do the wow i didn't write that headline right like you know he no he, he loved, meant it sincerely yeah he loved or whether that. he did or not he he, he was he was gonna yeah die yeah whether he did or not he was sincerely. very happy about you know yeah. like, like like he i he, he showed every side of enjoying the controversy right so yeah. Uh, yeah. you know like the uh i mean actually i think the the content of the article is is um uh is actually not even super incendiary, but uh, but but he also enjoyed the fact that it went out under that headline and that it pissed people off in the way that he did, did right? Yeah. So uh, yeah. so so yeah, I mean, he certainly would have, you know, and, and I mean, he was, uh, I mean, you know, he also had, uh, you know, he he was also on record as 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 disliking the absolute taboo about saying the N word, even while quoting people, and you know, and and uh, yeah. Uh, there's- Several yeah. recordings of him saying it. By the current standards of cancellation, he he would have been cancelled. Yeah, no, no doubt about it, right? So, I think the more interesting question is what he would have thought about kind of the other end of the that version of the culture war, you know, and and uh, what's the other know. end? What do you mean? Oh, okay, so. Um, so in other words, like, okay, so yes, he would not have been particularly woke. He would have been super canceled. I think all of that stuff is pretty safe. I think sure. that the, uh, I think that, uh, I think the more interesting question is maybe what he would have thought about certain kinds of like anti-wokeness uh, as they existed, you know, in, in the last several years in the U S right. So, um, and, you know, elsewhere, but, you know, we kind of tend to be the epicenter of, you know, the whole <laughs> thing, you know, so, uh, so. No one doesn't like the Americans. <laughs> so uh you know so i'm thinking both of like you know what was for a while called the intellectual dark web which was uh consisted of people like jordan peterson and ben shapiro but also of hitchens's old friend sam harris um and, and hitchens undoubtedly would have been roped in there had he still been around i think because him and harris yeah. would have stayed very cozy i think had the same uh topics to be speaking about and so forth yeah i, I think that it is you know, right. I think that it is entirely plausible that he would have stayed pretty cozy with Harris. I think that the, I think that there are some specific views that Harris took that um, I, I think it'd be fascinating to see how Hitchinson would have reacted to, you know, mm. if, if he'd, if he'd remained alive. Right. I think that the sort of like, one of the big ones is uh, Harris's, defense of uh of charles murray and uh and 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 some of the commentary on iq and all that stuff because hitchens was at the you know at the very least strongly on record as as disagreeing with all of that you know at the Mm. at the time yeah true that would have been i've never i've been thought about it's so funny how that was everything for a while and you know yeah 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 yeah. no it's right it's all goes to the memory hole but yeah uh, so, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, so, so I do, I do think that like some of the things that might have moved Harris in that direction could easily have moved Hitchens also. On the other hand, like you, you get into some questions here though. Like what, what would he have thought of some of the company that that would have put him in? Right. I mean, like, you know, what, like I, I think, um, you know, I mean, I'd love to see Hitchens on Peterson. I think yeah, that exactly. Right. You know, <laughs> like, uh, you know, I, I think it's not hard to imagine him, yeah. uh, him, him strongly disliking Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I would actually love to read that regardless of what he thought, but they have a, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not hard to imagine him hating Jordan Peterson. And then, uh, and then what do you think about some of the stuff that's kind of happened in the last couple of years in terms of anti-woke backlash, 
I mean, one example that I have got a record about, I have an article about this in the, uh, the daily beast, uh, which, uh, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny timing, right? Cause I just had this book come out and in the last, uh, I, I had this line at the end of the book where, where I'm sort of saying that like, you know, love, uh, you know, whatever you think about Hitchens, uh, it's, um, you got to miss the fact that he was like all over the media as much as he was and, and that he was like as, as interested and eloquent as he was. And, uh, and, and I sort of contrast that to like a lot of, um, you know, similar media that, you know, a lot of uh, the way that the media is right now. And, mm. uh, yeah, what we started with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And, mm. uh, and so, and in the course of, of doing that, uh, I, I mentioned a few publications by name and, uh, and, and, and one of those has since invited me to, to start writing for them. So, uh, that's, uh, you know, so, uh, <laughs> I haven't you know, gotten I, I around to it yet. <laughs> yeah. They haven't gotten around to reading the book yet, I guess. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, actually, I think the first article I wrote for uh, for the Daily Beast was about, um, uh, which to be fair, uh, is, is is under different management, you know, than it was then. But uh, is uh, the editorial page anyway? So, um, so yeah, it's one of the first article I wrote for the Daily Beast uh, was about what Christopher Hitchens would have thought about the anti-critical race theory laws, uh, and and I make the case in there that uh, he would have hated all of that, you know, because uh, for a couple of reasons, right. Some of which we've already gotten into, but, uh, but, you know, I, I think one uh, that he was, um, you know, I mean, his sort of views, you know, I, I think he was very strongly opposed to, to, uh, to kind of ignoring the, the bad racial history of the United States. You know, I think he, I think he was pretty eloquent on that topic. Again, you know, he supported reparations uh, and two, you know, I think, uh, you know, he was very passionate, you know, about uh, about free speech. And he had, uh, and if you watch in particular, I'm thinking if there's a, this debate that he did at some university in Canada, I do not remember which one, uh, in like 2006 or seven, uh, where, you know, you can find if you just type into the YouTube search bar, Christopher Hitchens free speech, this will be one of the first things that will come up. And it's one of my all-time favorite Hitchens opening statements. You know, he he's you know he starts out by fire, fire. There you go. I've said it. The uh, you know not in a crowded theater. I'll grant you. And then he makes the show of like looking around the room at this university where he is. And says apparently I've said it in the dining hall at all Hogwarts. But <laughs> uh, and then it goes into the origins of the cliche about shouting fire in a crowded theater and how mm. that was actually. Um, how that was actually something that was, um, you know, Oliver Wendell, you know, the greatly overpraised Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, you know, when he when he said that about fire in a crowded theater was actually upholding the conviction of a uh, group of Jewish socialists who had been arrested for passing out uh, Yiddish language anti-war and anti-conscription literature during World War One, uh, and um, and his, you know, his, his his point essentially is that you you really shouldn't trust. Uh, uh, any sort of authority structure to tell you what counts as a real fire and what doesn't. Uh, and, um, and so I, I think when it comes to this sort of attempts to crack down, you know, whether it's framed in terms of critical race theory or gender ideology or whatever they, but to crack down on uh, basically the discussion of controversial ideas in classrooms, right. You know, I, I think he would have hated that, you know? So, mm. uh, so, so I do think that he would have been, I think there are at least certain kinds of manifestations of anti woke backlash that he would have had a big problem with. But um, but that said, um, would he have? Uh, uh, you know, that said, I don't think that anybody who was very woke would have liked him. Uh, and I, I think he probably would have. I think he probably would have reveled in that fact, which would be consistent with you know with what he. Uh, uh, you know, which, which would have been consistent with how he acted in his lifetime. Mm. Uh, and I guess finally, I think the only one I, I think that I didn't hit was Ukraine. So I guess just very briefly on Ukraine. Um, I think the most likely Hitchens take would have been sort of waxing eloquent about the evils of Vladimir Putin and, and being all in favor of everything, you know, that mm-hmm. the US and the UK were doing uh, to, um, uh, to aid Ukraine and you know, God knows. I mean, maybe you U.S. Know, intervention, maybe, maybe even U.S. intervention, right? I mean, like it's it's not out of it's not entirely out of the question that like you know, it's like that doesn't you know 
that doesn't break the imagination to like imagine him saying something mm. like that, right? Uh, on the other hand, um, the is it possible that you know even if he was never willing to quite say he was wrong about Iraq, that you know his hands having been a little bit burned about how badly that went, that like it did put him in a different place about some of this stuff and that he could have said something else. It's possible. I'm probably stretching, but the one thing that's making me think this is that I'm just remembering um, the, some of what he's written about the, uh, the Cuban missile crisis, uh, which, um, which, which I have to say has very much been on my mind uh, since all of this started. Uh, and, uh, and he's got this very, very funny line about how, um, uh, like everybody else in my generation, I can remember where I was and what I was doing on the day when uh, President John F. Kennedy nearly killed me. <laughs> so, the, the, yeah, who knows? The final one was uh, political extremes. Uh, you don't have to comment on it if you don't think it's worth saying, but it's quite clear that a smaller and well, at least from my perspective, smaller and smaller minority on both the left and right are dominating all political discussion. Um, oh, yeah. Well, I think there's, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, I think there's a sense in which that's true. I mean, I think that there's, I think it depends a little bit what you mean, because, um, like, I don't think, um, I mean, you know, look, who's, who's running, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, who's running the Democratic Party in the US, the Labour Party in the UK, right? I mean, not, not exactly, uh anybody you could mistake for, for being representatives of the radical left in both cases at this point. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think on certain kinds of like policy things, I would maybe push a little bit back on that, but I, I think that's consistent with knowing what you mean, right? That in other words, like, I think some of this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about, about media fragmentation, right? I mean, that there, there is, I think, um, a lot of incentive to, to use certain kinds of apocalyptic rhetoric in the culture war. And um, yeah, what Hitchens would have made of all of that is tricky because um, on the one hand, you know, he's, uh, I, you know, I, I tend to, you know, I think in the last years, you know, he, he enjoyed feeling unclassifiable uh and um and you know and and i think it's entirely possible he would have continued to have a weird mixture of positions and um uh and that you know that feels very plausible so on the other on the other hand i mean to the extent that you think that martin davis is right that you know that that he he sort of drew his energy from from being you know from being like passionately attached to big causes i mean i think mm. some of this depends on what it is that you think might be going on there that you sure, know might yeah. have, might have given him that charge, you know, so it's a little mm-hmm. bit hard to tell. Mm. Uh, look, I, I've been, you've been very generous with your time uh, and I do have more questions, but I'm thinking that I'm not going to ask you, I'd love to hear you speak about, say, Sam Harris, because you, mm. uh, in one of your interviews, it seems like you have a, a pretty visceral uh, dislike of the yes. man. Um, but I won't ask you now because my friend will derail it. Um, there's... One or two more about Hitchens, I guess. And then some questions I try to ask as many guests as possible. So how does that sound? Okay. Can we do, um, I, as hilarious as it sounds that I would actually manage to stick to my end of this. Can we do this as kind of a lightning round thing? Cause I, I probably should get off. Absolutely. For sure. All right. Um, All right. I mean, it's, it's in your hands how quickly you make sure, it. Sure. 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 Fair enough. So, I'll do my best. Let's try it. In response to the book. What have you discovered about Hitchens's legacy that mm. surprised you? Yeah, um, I think in certain ways, uh, I think what surprised me was both how strong the feelings were of those people who do continue to be not like, you know, uh, ambivalent like me, right? You know, uh, but uh, but but to to have, um, you know, but to just but to just think that like you know, two thousand and seven Hitchens sort of you know got everything right. And on the on the other hand, 
I think what's maybe more interesting to me is the number of people who um, have political views that are very, very unlike late Hitchens mm. uh, who will, who will, uh, you know, when the subject admire comes up. admire adore him. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, just, just, I mean, you know, Bhaskar Sankara is the founder of Jacobin. He blurbed the book. He's definitely, you know, he's definitely in that category, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and there were, there were several people who were like that. And I suppose that will then feed into this last uh, question about Hitchens directly. Charlie yeah. Rose um, surmised Hitchens in and one year anniversary of his death interview that he did uh, with the following love him or hate him. You could not ignore him because he said things with such brilliance. And uh, so I want to ask you if you agree with that. And then also that maybe feeds into why there could be all these people that admire him, despite the fact they don't agree with him necessarily politically at all. Yeah. I, yes. And yes. Right. I think that, I think that the, you know, Charlie Rose quote is exactly right. And I think that, I think that definitely feeds into it, that they are, there is, um, I mean, somebody who I think is like, Somebody who I think, like on the surface, has no trace whatsoever of of, of Hitchens or her views uh, is uh, uh, Natalie Wynn, who's a YouTuber who's better known as Contrapoints, and and I remember oh, wow. uh, okay. that um, uh, that she uh, there's a profile of her by Liza Featherstone in the Nation uh, where where Natalie says that some of her approach to like making video essays and stuff is influenced by her trying to replicate the feeling that she got reading Christopher Hitchens that like even when she didn't agree with what he was saying, she still liked, you know, mm-hmm. reading him say that, you know, that she, she, she wanted to, to try to cre- try to recreate that, you know, for, uh, for other people. And, and it also definitely ties into what I was saying at the end of the book, what I was saying earlier in the interview about how, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the value of Hitchens for me is that he's such a, he's such a good writer and, and he has, and he often has such a unique perspective that obviously when he's, you know, when you think he's right, right, he's the person who you sort of most want to make that case. And when you think he's wrong, you know, he's the person that you you want to disagree with because it's it's going to be so much more interesting that you could that you know because he does have this way of you know like the the Hitchens things that I most disagree with, right? You know, we'll still have these little moments of like, ah, oh, shit, that's actually a good point, isn't it? Yeah, go ahead, exactly. And maybe that's like an ultimate testament to uh, to his legacy. Um, finally, Mr. Burgess, uh, yeah. forgive me. You've probably been asked this a zillion times in the last few weeks. Um, but did you speak with Rogan about Hitchens off air? Oh, no, sadly, that would have been really interested. Yeah, uh, I, I was, I was so disappointed that Joe never brought it up, but anyway. no, no, that's true. That's true. Yeah. It's, it's a very, um, yeah, I mean, it's like on the one hand, it's a three-hour interview that that's that sort of uh, gets it, you know, like like there's just this amazing range of things that we uh, that we talked about. Um, I guess I could have wedged it in because there was a minute when we were talking about religion, and I I, I could have, if I'd had the presence of mind to do so at the time, I could have said something <laughs> about Hitchens, and we, and you know, he probably would have like, you know, been like, oh yeah, you know, whatever, like, and you know, he would have said something about that, and we would have gotten yeah. off into a little Hitchens tangent. So that's on me, but um, but no, we uh, you know, we didn't uh, we didn't do that. The uh, the the conver- the conversation off air uh, was. Um, I'm trying to think how much I could reasonably say about this, but I have a, uh, but it was, it was, it was interesting. Uh, well, does he it, like ask you to not share certain things? No, no, he didn't. I, I was, I, I, there's no, there's no NDA here. I'm just, I'm just trying to think what, <laughs> what, what feels like a, what feels like a reasonable thing to pass on about that conversation. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think he had, uh, I mean, some of it was like preview what we told, what we ended up talking about on air and, you know, mm. and, and, uh, you know, so, you know, some of it was like COVID related because, you know, because because he's constantly surrounded by controversies about that. And he had, mm. he had, he had, you know, recent guests on, you know, or about that. But I mean, that's also not, you know, I mean, that's also like, as I'm sure you can tell from the interview itself. I mean, that's all like also the last thing that I really wanted to engage with him on because like it's 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 because I don't. Yeah, you know, you'd get I, into a disagreement. It'd be awkward. Well, and, and I mean, there were things that we definitely disagreed about over the course of the interview, but I mean, I think that the, but I think that the, 
uh, I think it's less the fact that we disagree um, than that, like, we disagree and I'm also much less interested in the topic than he is, you know, that like, right, uh, cause, yeah, cause it's, yeah. cause, cause it's like, not that I'm not, you know, not that I'm indifferent to the worldwide plague that's had all this cataclysmic, you know, <laughs> consequences, you know, that that's not interesting to me, but like, just that, like, I, I made a decision fairly early on that I wasn't going to be like hyper aware of every twist and turn of what was going on about this. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. really want thinking about COVID to like dominate my life during the COVID years. And, and so it's like, I'm kind of in the, I mean, I, Actually, there's a conversation that Joe Rogan did have back in I don't know late 2020 with uh, Bill Burr that uh, where, where where Burr definitely uh, was the representative of how I feel about this. Uh, where um, Burr, you know, like Rogan has like started to bring up COVID stuff, and it's like kind of funny because they're like sitting there drinking, you know, like smoking cigars, and, you know, <laughs> drinking, and he and and Burr's like, Joe, are we really going to do this? you without a medical degree, me without a medical degree, you know, it's like, I, I, I don't know anything about this. I, I have a, you know, I, I, I check the news like once a month to see whether I still need to wear a mask. You know, that's, you know, that, that's how much I engage with this, you know, which is like, you know, maybe not quite to that level, but like, I don't, you know, I mean, there are people who spend all their time like boated up on the details so they can like argue with conspiracy theorists and things like that. And that's, that's mm. just not, you know, there is, only so much time and energy you can have in your life to, to, you know, for so many topics. And, and that's just, you know, not one that I gravitate to. So like, I, I sort of have a general sense that, um, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think I have a decent understanding of what the consensus medical view is and I, I'm prepared. Sure. Sure. Yeah. No, you don't have to, you don't have to justify (laughs) yourself here. Um, what about the, what about the effect of Joe Rogan, uh, because mm-hmm. it is very interesting that he genuinely has the biggest platform in the world for someone to appear on. Uh, do right. you have any insight as to how many people downloaded that episode you uh, featured on and stuff like no that? No clue. Yeah, no clue. Sadly, spot. What about like book sales signals that you can get for how it affected? Yeah, your, I mean, it's. Your, I mean, there was uh, there was image. definitely a little spike, you know, uh, right out. You know, there was definitely a spike, you know, uh, especially the one we talked about right after I went on. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think that. However many people watch, I mean, there was a clip that was posted on YouTube that had like a million and some viewers. Uh, I would assume it's like whatever it is. I would assume that the actual Spotify numbers, because that's that's how most people are going to access it, you know, are much higher than that. I mean, you see this you see this number thrown around a lot that that allegedly like it gets like 11 million downloads. It's a little hard to track down where that number comes from, but like even mm, if it's mm. you know even if it's like a quarter of that, right? I mean that's that's still you know well, why didn't you still, ask that's, him? That's 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 I yeah I probably should have. Uh, that's still a uh, that's still a ridiculous number of. Um, uh, I guess he did ridiculous start following me on Twitter after this. I could yeah. I could send him a DM, but uh, they uh, but uh, but yeah, look as far as the influence goes, I think it's hard to. I think it's I think it's really hard to quantify, and I think it's also part of what makes this tricky is that I think most of the episode, like I think the sort of most attention grabbing controversial stuff that he does is is like a minority of the episode. Like I think the episode right after the one I was on was like I think it was like with somebody who's like a who'd like written a book like a who's like a. a a chef or nutrition guru or something, you know, that was, uh, you know, yeah. like it, it, it's very, it's all over the place. Right. I mean, like, I think he's somebody who's, who's interested in politics and, 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 you know, has people on to talk about it and has political opinions, but I think he's at least as interested in like, you know, mixed martial arts and psychedelics and, you know, and comedy for and sure, half a dozen other sure. things, you know. Yeah. I mean, half so, the episodes so, are comedians, you know. Like, yeah, no, I think that's pretty, yeah. yeah, more than anybody else, right? It's, yeah, it's, he's exactly. going to have, he's going to have comedians on. So, uh, so how exactly the influence filters out is, um, is really hard to say. And I think especially gets complicated when you look at the fact that uh, there are other countries where the podcast is also quite popular, you know, where, uh, you know, the sort of local COVID politics are very different, you know, than they are mm-hmm. in the, uh, in, in the U S I mean, I think that, I mean, look, if I could, if I could magically get him to, you know, to, to think what I think about that, you know, then, then, then I think that'd be better. You know, I think <laughs> obviously that would be better. Uh, I think that the, but I also think that like, if you want to talk about his overall influence, part of what makes that a little bit murkier to me is like that um, he is somebody who 
really does politically in the political episodes have a pretty remarkable range of people on. And so there are people who, you know, there are people who like, and I'm, I'm not even just talking about people whose politics are like my politics. Like I think there are people who, you know, I might disagree with about lots of things, but I can still appreciate the fact that they could like go on that show and say things that you don't hear very much in mainstream media sources. Like, uh, like, like Dave Smith could come on and, and talk about, you know, the Saudi war in Yemen, which is, which, which is, which is objectively like really one of the great like human rights catastrophes of our era. And, and is, is just nowhere on the main, on the radar of the, of the mainstream media. You know, you could, you know, no you find people, you know, so, uh, and, and even with the right wing guests, um, I, I also even think there is some value to the fact that even though, you know, look, I mean, I think he's a, you know, you know, he's a lover, not a fighter. He does not by and large have people on to, uh, to, 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 you know, to argue with them. Well, he, I think by and large, he has the mod to just kind of shoot the shit and chat with them. But, um, I think the fact that, you know, there is a big contingent of right wingers who, who listen to the show and, and, and respect him and all that stuff does make it valuable when he does have right wing guests on who sometimes he will like really push back against pretty hard in some cases, you know, that they, uh, uh, you know, like the sort of, you know, there, there is from my perspective, a pretty legendary episode where he had Dave Rubin on and, and they're arguing about, uh, like safety regulations and the post office, and a lot of mm. things like that, that. I know that exactly I what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 I think it's fantastic. I think there are times when he's, you know, golfed or, uh, you know, Candace Owens. I think that there's, uh, I, I would, I would, um, there's a, you know, there was a time in the, um, in the political, in um, there was a time in like 2018, um, you know, when when he had an on-air rant about uh, Trump's immigration policies. He said, "If you don't have a problem with like taking you know children away from their mothers, you're not on Team Human." Uh, there was uh, on my episode, right? The episode that, that that was on. He he spends he spends time on there. Um, you know, he spends time on there, like making fun of uh, of of Ben Shapiro for uh, for his for his opposition to uh, to same sex marriage and you know gay rights. Uh, so I I think that there are actually you know there are actually certain areas in which I think he's a he's actually a useful voice of of uh, of compassion and, and and rationality for you know for those followers, even if he obviously also says other things that I completely disagree with. And I mean, I I guess. I guess I would think, and maybe this does get us back to Hitchens a little bit, that it's, I think that liberals spend it all their time worried about whether Joe Rogan is going to influence people to believe bad things, I think maybe does show a troubling lack of confidence in what they think, you know, that they, that, um, cause, cause I'm, I'm much more concerned with the opposite, right? I mean, I'm much more concerned with like, things that I agree with not getting enough of a hearing than things that I disagree with, you know, getting, getting more of a hearing. And I mean, like, I, I don't, I, I guess, I guess I think that if, if you're not kind of confident that if, it, if it's all out there, right, that you could persuade people that you're right, then I'm very confused about how you think you're going to achieve any of your political objectives. Mm. Um, don't hold it against me. That was a long answer. There's two more it, and they're one word nice. answers. So you can do it. Uh, you can perfect, do it quickly. Perfect. Even though that uh, was a perfectly natural place to end it. I just can't not sure, ask sure, you. Sure, 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 sure. I don't know if this was intentional or subconscious, but it seemed like when you were writing in opposition to Hitchens, you referred to him as either Hitchens or Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> but then when you were writing in agreement, you referred to him as Hitch. Was this a conscious uh, thing? I, or- it wasn't conscious, but it is interested. Okay. And finally, I would love to ask you the three that I ask everyone, but it'll take too much time. Perhaps someday in the future, sure. you might be interested in doing another one. Yeah, but, you can come back and, and, and do one where we talk about Sam Harris. Yeah. Um, yes. So final question, Mr. Burgess. Conversation between any two people of history, dead or alive, no language barrier, except in this scenario, one of them is Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> okay. All right. Who do I most want to see Christopher Hitchens uh, talk to? Um, Marks. Karl Marx. Amazing. Karl Marx. Amazing. Yeah. 
Ben, I uh, really uh, sincerely thank you for being so generous with your time. Um, I really enjoyed that. And uh, you, as you could probably tell, I could uh, just talk about Hitchens for, yeah, for ages. So thank you very much, mate. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Cheers, Ben. Now here is uh, some of my favorite quotes and also a passage from Hitch 22. It is uh, Hitchens own response to the famous Proust questionnaire, which was a series of questions that Vanity Fair, a uh, magazine that Hitchens had a monthly column with that, that they would feature with people that they were trying to profile. And supposedly with a Proust questionnaire, if these questions are answered in full, it reveals one's true nature. And because everything is better in Hitchens' voice, what do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Just to give you an idea, Proust's reply was to be separated from Mama. I think that the lowest depth of misery ought to be distinguished from the highest pitch of anguish. In the lower depths come enforced idleness, sexual boredom and or impotence. At the highest pitch, the death of a friend or even the fear of the death of a child. Where would you like to live? In a state of conflict or a conflicted state? What is your idea of earthly happiness? To be vindicated in my own lifetime. To what faults do you feel most indulgent? To the ones that arise from urgent material needs. Who are your favorite heroes of fiction? Dennis Barlow, Humbert Humbert, Horatio Hornblower, Jeeves, Nicholas Salmanovich Rubashoff, Funish the Memorius, Lucifer. Who are your favorite characters in history? Socrates, Spinoza, Thomas Paine, Rosa Luxemburg, Leon Trotsky. Who are your favorite heroines in real life? The women of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran who risked their lives and their beauty to defy the foulness of theocracy. Ayan Hashi Ali and Azan Afizi as their ideal feminine model. Who are your favorite heroines of fiction? Maggie Tulliver, Dorothea, Becky Sharp, Candy, O, Bertie's Aunt Delia. Your favorite painter? Goya, Otto Dix. Your favorite musician? J.S. Park, Bob Dylan. The quality you most admire in a man? Courage, moral and physical. Anima, the ability to think like a woman. Also a sense of the absurd. The quality you most admire in a woman? Courage, moral and physical. Anima, the ability to visualize the mind and need of a man, also a sense of the absurd. Your favorite virtue? An appreciation for irony. Your least favorite virtue, or nominee for the most overrated one? Faith, closely followed, in view of the overall shortage of time, by patience. Your proudest achievement? Since I can't claim the children as solely mine, being the dedicatee of books by Salman Rushdie and Martin Amis and poems by James Fenton and Robert Conquest. Your favorite occupation? Travel in contested territory, hard working, writing and reading when safely home, in the knowledge that an amusing friend is later coming to dinner. Who would you have liked to be? Prometheus, Oscar Wilde, Emile Zola. Your most marked characteristic? Insecurity. What do you most value in your friends? Their continued existence. What is your principal defect? Becoming bored too easily. What to your mind would be the greatest of misfortunes? Loss of memory. What would you like to be? One who understood music and chess and mathematics, or one who had the courage to bear arms? What is your favorite color? Blue, sometimes red. What is your favorite flower? Garlic. What is your favorite bird? The owl. What word or expression do you most overuse? Rereading a collection of my stuff, I was rather startled to find that it was perhaps. Who are your favorite poets? Philip Larkin, Robert Conquest, W. H. Auden, James Fenton, W. B. Yeats, Chidiok Tichborn, G. K. Chesterton, Wendy Cope. What are your favorite names? Alexander, Sophia, Antonia, Celeste, Liam, Hannah, Elizabeth, Wolfgang. What is it you most dislike? Stupidity, especially in its nastiest forms of racism and superstition. 
Which historical figures do you most despise? Stanley Baldwin, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Which contemporary figures do you most despise? Henry Kissinger, Osama bin Laden, Joseph Ratzinger. Which events in military history do you most admire? Thermopylae, Lepanto, the defense of Little Round Top at Gettysburg, mutinies in the German army in 1918 and the German general staff in 1944, the Royal Navy's Arctic convoys. Which natural gift would you most like to possess? The ability to master other languages, which would have hugely enhanced the scope of these answers. How would you like to die? Fully conscious, and either fighting or reciting, or fooling around. What do you most dislike about your appearance? The way in which it makes former admirers search for neutral words. What is your motto? Allons travailler. This more imperative version of Get On With It is annexed from Emile Zola, though E.M. Forster somewhat overextended it by enjoining us to get on with your own work and behave as if you were immortal. Though this is only a party game, which is the form in which Proust was twice persuaded to play it, it can be revealing. Reviewing my own answers, I, at any rate, can see where I give away more of myself than might be obvious. Take the answer to the question about the principal defect. I used also to play the game of, if you were an animal, what animal would you be? When others chose for me, I was quite frequently a fox. Lately, however, there have been quite a few nominations of badger. This is not merely a question of my becoming stouter and more grizzled. It is the downside of what I consider one of my happier skills as well. In other words, I would often rather have an argument or a quarrel than be bored. And, because I hate to lose an argument, I am often willing to protract one for its own sake rather than concede even a small point. Plainly, this unwillingness to give ground, even on unimportant disagreements, is the symptom of some deep-seated insecurity, as was my one-time fondness for making teasing remarks, which I amended when I read Anthony Pohl's matter-of-fact observation that teasing is an unfailing sign of misery within, and as is my very pronounced impatience. The struggle, therefore, is to try and cultivate the virtuous side of these shortcomings, to be a genial host while only slightly whiffled, for example, or to be witty at the expense of one's own weaknesses instead of those of other people. I am often described to my irritation as a contrarian, and even had the title inflicted on me by the publisher of one of my early books. At least on that occasion, I lived up to the title by ridiculing the word in my introduction to the book's first chapter. And finally, some of my favourite quotes from Hitch. Um, I keep these on my website, when I find great quotes, I, I keep them organized there. So it's actually a maybe a 20, 30 page document at this stage of just great characters in fiction, but also real people of history and uh, some of their quotes written down. And I ripped this directly from there. So I won't read them all. There's 19 in total, but I'll just pick as I go through the ones that stand out to me the most. Nationalism is most prominent at its periphery. Uh, that is such a great insight when you, you know, think about it just a, a little bit more i think in my understanding of it is just that the extremist sides we see in our politics both on the left and the right are actually most prominent in their periphery at the at the edges and in fact the center of whatever some extremism might be um, is in fact less extreme than you might think what can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence one of hitchens great uh, lines that he would often invoke when uh, debating the religiosos of the world. The essence of the independent mind lies not in what it thinks, but in how it thinks. High moral character is not a precondition for great moral accomplishments. You have to choose your future regrets. This is one quote of his that gained in prominence uh, towards, well, at the end of his life after he had been diagnosed with cancer because there was so much made of how much of a bohemian and burning the candle to both ends uh, Hitchens' lifestyle was, smoking and drinking um, in, <laughs> in heavy quantities. And you read this line now, you have to choose your future regrets a little bit differently because perhaps 
there's a very conscious awareness of how bad something might be for you, but in the short term, it feels good. <laughs> this is a funny one. Everybody does have a book in them, but it is in most cases that that's where it should stay. <laughs> Cheap booze is a false economy. Now, that's obviously one that you have to learn through experience, but I remember trying to figure out what that meant. Basically, it just means if you buy the cheapest vodka on the shelf to try and save yourself, you know, 50% compared to the nice vodka, the hangover is going to cost way more than that slither of savings you made at the, at the, at the shelf. Hitchens famously drunk um, Johnny Black, which, you know, is a very, very nice whiskey or scotch. Oh, this is an amazing one. He accused me of trying to assassinate his character and I had to remind him, no, I'm afraid your character committed suicide a long time ago. I most respect Jesus for being able to turn water into wine. I can only turn water into piss. He seems to be chewing far more than he bites off. Oh, this was an, this was also, um, this was also a quote that resonated quite deeply with me. And I think it can be um, related to more artistic processes than just writing. Um, but I hate not to write, though I'm not sure I enjoy it. The real pleasure comes much later when you see it in print. You know, because there's so much made of uh, follow your bliss and, you know, follow your dreams and do what you love. And, you know, does one truly love laboring over an artistic task? Or is it just in the pure satisfaction you get once it's completed and good that you think maybe you, you enjoy the labor of it? I certainly very rarely feel like I'm enjoying myself when I'm trying to write something. Instead, I'm just very happy when it's finished and I realize that there's a linear thought there. Oh, this is a beautiful one. For me, to remember friendship is to recall those conversations that it seemed a sin to break off. The ones that made the sacrifice of the following day a trivial one. And then finally, a classic Hitchens quote. The four most overrated things in life are champagne, lobster, anal sex, and picnics. All right, everyone, I'm just going to quickly describe my uh, ambition for this podcast. And if you still listened uh, this far through, then you're an absolute legend. But because it's Ben Burgess and he's got a big audience, I'm sort of hoping that maybe there is going to be some uh, fresh ears to this podcast. So welcome and thank you for tuning in. If this is the first time you've ever listened to this podcast, what I'm trying to do with this podcast is corner the market for eclectic curiosities in whatever country it is you're listening in from. So what does eclectic curiosities mean in the podcast realm? Basically, there isn't a genre for it, uh, but it just is a reflection of my own interests. And week in, week out, I am managing to speak with people who are somehow experts or very, very well refined people in some interest that I have at that moment. So this is clearly about Hitchens, a very, very long and, and passionate, strong interest of mine. But uh, geothermal energy has been on my mind lately. And so the last you know four or five episodes have been speaking to the CEOs of the largest geothermal uh, technology companies in the world and then also someone in the venture capital of uh, geothermal. There was a Stephen Hicks episode with uh, Friedrich Nietzsche that came out quite recently. Um going forward next week, Nicholas Shackson, Treasure Islands, trying to document the plumbing of the offshore world because financial secrecy and the the tools that offshore accountants rely on truly is the cancer of the world that allows for all the kleptocracy and it allows, uh, quite frankly, for just the most egregious corruption that comes straight from the top. So just uh, taking a sample of the last few weeks, these are where my interests have taken me and these are the podcasts that have been produced because of it. So welcome if you're new welcome back if you're old uh, that's my hope how can you make this podcast better one by listening this far is is amazing but subscribe to the show and leave nice healthy juicy thick reviews so pump your juice into the algorithm five stars everywhere comments everywhere pull over people on the side of the road get them to leave reviews as well put as much energy into the various algorithms as possible and then hopefully that might translate into a little bit of show growth which means again I can actually um, approach more and more people. They become more accessible. So that's all from me. Thank you so much for listening. You're all legends. Take it easy. Ciao.